So my name is Najati Aiden, so I'm uh, from Eastern Turkey. Uh, so I have quite diverse educational background. I started actually as a nurse, you know, I went to the nursing school here, high school, and then once I was doing, you know, some healthcare thing, but then I went to political science, uh, but I didn't like politics, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, you know, I majored in economics, and then did my, you know, uh, master PhD, and then I also did PhD in education as well. I have two PhD, one in economics, one in education, um, and now I'm in uh, I'm at uh, Al Faisal University, is a private university in Saudi Arabia. Is a you know, um, have been there for 11, 12 years, I think. And before I was in the US, when I finished my PhD there, for 10 years I was there. Um, so I'm um, basically in last. Eight years, I think, we have been working on this two words, Mane, Harfi Mane, is me essentially. And uh, so we established an institute called Institute of Integrated Knowledge uh, in US. So, and we have with a, a group of scholars working on this concept. So, so one of our, so our president is Dr. Al Faslan. So, and we develop a model, try to, so we work first on the theoretical side for quite a long time and publish a book on Rutledge on the subjects called Site Nursery Science uh, in Islam. Uh, and then uh, we uh, work on the practical side, try to see how we can come up with a, a practical model for education. Um, that took like three, four years. Now we are, we think we're ready, we are working to develop um, uh, publish educational workbooks. So we have seven works books is about to be finished uh, for the kindergarten to grade six is on science subjects in terms of how to integrate science and um, revelations or, or how to apply the Harfi perspective to that. And we provide a, a training for teachers. And so we are now in a way that, that we're moving towards developing the whole school model with the integrated holistic curriculum that we can basically, you know, um, have the school to subscribe to the models, and we provide the training and they give the material directly. Um, but we start with science subjects, but we think the Harfi perspective can apply to all other subjects area as well. But science is relatively easy to apply. We're going to go to the social science and human sciences as well, and try to see how we can apply the Harfi perspective there as well. Okay, um, so. I think overall that my understanding that what I have, uh, you know, I just want to get s some input from you to see whether I, I have the right menu for you that you will like it at least. But I think s it seems like we have it because, you know, Sister Tuba helped me and gave me some, you know, feedback in terms of what is really your uh, main interest area. Uh, and I prepared some things and I was working on it yesterday night as well. Um, so, and, and I think uh, what I'm hearing, I don't need to really modify anything. I think that's going to be really a good fit. Um, so, uh, this is overall what we're going to talk about. So, we're going to talk about three main subjects, okay? So, we talk about science and psychnosis. We talk about the main problem with the science and then the solution, which in terms of the worldview and formation of Tawheed based on worldview. So again, this is normally, we can cover those like basically um, in you know 10 hours, but for you, we're gonna really have it just two days for like two hours, two hour max. So we'll try to do our best to really cover those subjects as much as we could. Uh, so we'll always start with the brain exercise, that's why I like it, you know, because in the morning, particularly when you're sleepy, so it's good to have some exercise. So in my teaching style, as I mentioned, I have a background in education, so I always start with brain exercise. So here's the brain exercise question for you. A group of high school students in Kastamonu went to Nursi, and they said this. They said that, um, tell us about our creator, our teachers do not speak of God. And Nursi, in response, he said, he said, I said, I told to them, all the sciences you study continuously speak of God, make known the creator, each with its own particular tongue. Do not listen to your teachers, listen to the sciences. Now, uh, first, first question is, what is, what is the complaint of student? What they're complaining about actually here? Yes? There's an internal conflict in the mind that they're not sure how to resolve. 
The conflict? They see the conflict? There's an internal conflict in their mind which they're not sure how to resolve. Um, but is that, what did you get it? Did they say that they conflict? That, that, did they say anything in terms of a conflict they have it? Because remember the statement says, they says, tell us about our creator, our teachers do not speak of God. So when they say our teachers do not speak of God, what is really their main complaint? Yes? For them, it's not explicit. So maybe the teacher's not using verses of the Quran, for example, or uh, using terminologies that are coming. Oh, it's so specific. teachers are not talking about God. Okay. Okay. Yes, I do. They don't feel like they're being fed spiritually. Okay. Good. Is there anything here that's saying that the teachers tell them something anti-religious? Is they complaining that teachers is actually, you know, giving them some atheistic ideology? Not necessarily, but it's a lack. No, that's, yes, right. And they're divorced, in a sense, what they've learned in their minds from our Creator. So they themselves have divorced it, even though what, what they're being taught, they can actually integrate, you know, um, God or, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they can integrate it as a sign what they're learning, but within their minds, they've completely separated the two things. So for them, it's like, when I'm learning these things, I'm not hearing signs of our Creator. Very, very good. So it's actually, I found, yes? They are not understanding, uh, actually, well, actually, teachers are telling them signs, but uh, students are not getting the, uh, who is God. Hmm. So what is this actually? This is, the students are saying that, look, we are getting secular education in which there is no mentioning of God. This is exactly what is happening everywhere around the world, right? You know, except so-called Islamic schools, right? So everyone around, even in Islamic schools, in science subjects, there's no room for God actually. So you could just talk about, you just talk about science. So you, if the subject is a physics, you talk about physics. It's chemistry, you talk about chemistry. Why should you mention God in chemistry and physics? You see that basically, when I find out that the statement, I really want to, when we start to work on this one, I find out that, you know, those students, amazingly, they really, through the way they ask the question, they identify the root cause of the problem in education. Though they have no real, you know, background of what's happening with the education, but the way they, you know, I, I think there's no coincidence, Allah made them speak in this way. So it seems like if you truly study, as I mentioned, we've been working on this like for eight years. If you ask me what is the problem in education, what is the problem with knowledge, I will not say the problem is evolution. I will not say the problem they're talking about, you know, they deny God as atheism. I will say the problem is they exactly as he describes. The problem is they do not mention God, which means the problem is they separate the creator from creation. So, and they talks about creation without creator. So that is the problem. And it seems like it's really, I was like amazed the way that they really identify the problem. Now, uh, what, is, what Nursi is saying is his response. Remember he's saying that do not listen to your teachers, but listen to the science they teach. What does it mean? Because first of all, remember a good teacher, if I'm a good teacher, what I'm supposed to do, I'm just say I teach physics. If I'm a good teacher, I will actually write my own textbook and then come and teach what I write in the textbook, right? So I don't have to rely on someone else, right? So, but here he's saying, don't listen to teachers and listen to the textbook. Don't you see there's some kind of contradictory point between the two? What does he mean really? Yes? Could it be that in the textbook you usually talk to like the hand, so if you always ask the question why, and then when you kind of interrogate what you're being taught from what's in the textbook, I think I read somewhere in one of the um, books that they 
obviously he said to his students, don't, um, when it, whatever you learn from me, take it to you, like an onion, and um, pound it until you figure out whether or not it's gold, if it's gold, it's stolen, you know, if it's copper, then you discard it. So I think just being, having a critical, um, but, but again, so you're saying that the textbook that it's like it's up to you, you will assess and then take what is good what, and you leave it at what is bad for you, right? So that way you say no problem to look at the text. But my point here is that a good teacher is the one that's basically just out loudly speaking what is in the textbook. So if the Nursi is very clear, he's saying do not listen to your teachers. If he's saying do not listen to your teachers, and then, then he's saying that, listen what the teachers teach you. Go and read the, the textbook, study the subject they are teaching you. Don't you think there's a contradiction here? So in other words, someone will tell you, don't, teach, don't listen to the instructor today, but go and study the slide. But I'm actually presenting you, I'm the one I prepared the slide, I'm the one presenting you the slide. What does it mean, you know, that you're supposed to pay attention to the slide and not listen to me? Yes, Brian? Possibly because when the instructor is speaking, he's conveying this information in a way that he sees it to uh -huh. the student. But when a student sees the textbook, he has the information there. And perhaps he has, perhaps he could see it in a different light. Cool. Sure. But again, but assume that th this instructor is very loyal to the textbook give it exactly what is in the textbook. Then in this case, do you think Nursi will say, go and listen to the teachers as well? Because he is very clear. He says that, do not listen to your teachers that who do not speak of God. But the problem, the textbook also do not speak of God. Remember the question was that, the, the question was that teachers do not speak of God. Then he says, don't listen to that. But you go and read it. Go and read the chemistry textbook. Would you find God in any part of any textbook? Then shouldn't he say, don't read this textbook, don't listen to the instructor, you know, go and read Quran? Or what do you think? What is really, what is the problem? See, those, this is really, you know, those type of questions will wake you up. I mean, you can't really get at the answer if you don't think deeply on that, right? That's why it was a brain exercise. You have to really deeply think about that. Because I tell you that I took this statement, I misunderstood this statement for years of years because I didn't really think deeply about it. And also because I just rely on those who, who, who told me in their, based on their own understanding. If they got it wrong, I got it wrong as well, because I didn't think about it. But once I start to actually study the subject, I realized that most Nursi readers got it very wrong on this statement. Because if you go and do the survey, you find out most Nursi readers do not really have any problem with science. If you tell them, is there a problem with science? Is there any problem with science? They say, no, 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 science is really is great things. Let's study, read, why? Oh, because that's what Nursi says, they will say. And they will point to some other example in, 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 in Nursi writing, and therefore, I, I think overall, um, if you do survey, you will find, I don't know, am I wrong on that one? I don't, uh, uh, actually, I disagree with you okay. in this topic, because I found that, what, what I found is more opposite one, the other extreme part, which is denying the sciences at all, right? Don't for the science, it's just faster thing. Oh, she? As a yeah, no, another, another nursery reader, so she's still defending that position, right? <laughs> and, of course, everybody, just like in the same community, you know, for uh, us telling something totally different sometimes, but we are understanding this in totally different, uh, from different perspectives. So, I found it the opposite way in general. I didn't actually come across uh, oh, so you mean that, who are thinking in that way. That you, mean, you, mean, you mean most nursery readers, they completed the nice science? Yeah, I oh, actually really? found okay. more. Oh, I, I thought that you are doing it. You, you think because, that's the uh, Specifically among illiterate or among uh -huh. uneducated people, kind of okay. more, uh -huh. as Ustad also describes, kind of a Sufi way of thinkers, like totally deny everything which is Western. But, but you need to, you need to look at the most educated one. I talked, I, I meant to talk about the educated one. You know, my understanding of educated one, the most they don't really have any problem with science. They think Nursi doesn't have any problem with science. 
And the reason they think that's based on this one. But I'm so okay with the idea. Most of the people don't understand, don't get the real idea what he's talking about. Okay. So what what is he really talking about? Anyone who has the idea? He, he, he wants to tell students to use your phone twice. Okay. There, to, when in, without, uh, of course, do not listen to your teacher mean that do not go to your teacher about that uh, because he is not talking to God, so you do not go to this side to your teacher about he is not telling you about God, but you yourself will have to go to the science which you are reading with your wife. Well, where did you get this idea? Huh? Where did you get this interpretation? As from the state? As, as you no, 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 no. From the state. State. Could you, you see anything? Speak of it. He said, Huh. All the sciences you study continuously speak of her. Okay. This from here. He said that he is saying that all the sciences you are going to study itself they are talking about God. Okay. So you yourself have to study in your But but, but again again, but put it in more practical side. If you open a physics textbook, chemistry textbook, biology textbook written for public school, for secular education, is there any place in which talks about God? Is there any place that you'll say, oh, this is really telling me something about God? This is what he is saying, that you do not go to your, uh, to your teacher. It means that you have to, this point you have to understand by your intellect. The okay. other, yeah. Good, very good. Yes, right. Uh, um, for example, when I was studying physics, I'd open up a textbook, but if I just ask the question, why does something happen like this, then I'd find in the honor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name or attributes or um, something about him. For example, when you look at, um, I don't know, why does, um, when you look at board, why does it go up, why does it go down? So that's something that's been created in some order there, some system there, that's something that's been designed, and so on. Good. good. So basically, very good. So what you find, in the, it is actually the answer is in that statement. He says that uh, there are two things. They speak, continue speaks of God, good. But actually, he's saying that uh, each of them speaks of God its own particular tongue. What does it mean? It means that basically, as they present it, it doesn't really talk about God. But if you learn the way to read, which is that's the harfi perspective, manai harfi. So he's saying that the textbook as is doesn't really speak of God. But if you gain a new glasses, that is the manai harfi perspective, through which that you look at, read this textbook, you will find everything in the textbooks that actually speaks of God. In this regard, he thinks there is no problem with the science if you have the right perspective. But that's, you know, most people took it wrong in a sense that as if Nursi has no problem. Nursi has a problem because he says, do not listen to teachers, which means the teachers provide you directly from a secular perspective through an Ismi perspective. And Nursi is saying that, look, don't listen in that way. But if you gain the right perspective, that's the Harfi perspective, that you can look at the science and you can see they speak of God. Now look at this. Those are two scientists. This is what they think. Uh, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking says, before we understood, understood science, it was natural to believe that God created the universe. But now science offers a more convincing explanation, which means no need to have God anymore. See? So do you see that? What is, what is the role of science and what is the God, what, why we don't need God? Then you see the other one, Francis Collins, and he was well accomplished, the head of NIH for, for many years in the US. He wrote a, one of a, a beautiful book called The Language of God. It's an amazing book, really. He says the God of the Bible is also the God of genome. God can be found in cathedral or in the lab. Now, what, what, do you, what, is, what do you think? And it's really, uh, who is right and how could you really, you know, 
those are well-accomplished scientists. They have completely different perspective when come to science. So what is the why why Hawking or people like Hawking they deny God? And why people like Collins who actually think that you should have a God when you study science? What do you think here? What is what is your take on such uh, Edmund? I think you were you, you already know those guys well, both of them, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, the way that I, I had been interpreting this, and I, I think it might be a little different from where we're going. Here, okay. Uh, is that the questions of existence uh, are properly philosophical questions, mm -hmm. uh, and using merely the empirical method and founding of the sciences, stripping away all of the theory and other intellectual things that generate hypotheses, but but merely the I could say we could say the undisputed observations of the universe. Uh, that's not sufficient or proper to justify statements like this at all. You, you need, as a human being, you need to encounter a world more broadly than peer-reviewed papers will give you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so in other words, you know, I think that's exactly where we're going to go for that. So in other words, how can you say that the existence or the universe or the reality can be purely explained through empirical experimental you know, um, uh, data or, or knowledge, right? So in this case, they're saying, if you really want to understand anything, let's say if you study physics, so we can you use a scientific way and gather our data and establish our understanding and find an answer to our question. So you don't really need a, a God in to study physics. Why, let's say, I want to understand, you know, how the universe has been formed. So if I can study science can explain to me, it helped to me, then why you need to have a God? So his point is that before there was a need because they called the God of gap, right? There was a gap in understanding, and so therefore you need a God to close the gap. But now he's saying science provides explanation for everything. So in other words, if I say, what is this? Science says, you know, okay, really, you want to know about this? This is a, what they call water. So it consists of an hydrogen and oxygen. So two hydrogen, one oxygen come together in a particular way, and the certain property emerge, and that's we call it water. Okay. So what else you want to know? I want to know hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. They delve into that one and say, oh, we, we discovered there's electron, protons, and subparticles, and then we discover the laws, and we can formulate that, we can experiment that, we can make a bomb. You know, what else you want? Okay. So in this case. If you really want to understand how everything works, and if you want to really use them and enjoy your life and gain the power or have a pleasure, so we can provide everything to you. Why do you need to have a God when you want to really drink water or want to have water and understand the water? That's the question. So, and if you're gonna teach about the water to kids, so you don't need to really talk about God. So you just explain it based on what science says, that's enough. Right? So, and that's what he's saying that. So the question in this case, what really science is all about? Can science answer all questions that we have in terms of what questions, how question, why question? If I ask about that, what is water? How is it formed? Why it has certain property? So can really science answer those questions? So if the science can answer those questions satisfactorily, then we can say no need for God. Or, you know, or if we think that you can't really do it without God, then we have to bring God into the science subject. So in a sense that we don't want to talk about really, you know, okay, let's talk about in a sense that a deistic universe in which that the God set all the laws and, you know, we, don't, we can explain everything with the assumption that at the beginning something somehow is formed and everything's run based on that one. That type of deistic one is actually leave no room for God because you can still explain everything except the very beginning, right? Then you can have discussion who was the, the one that set the whole system. We're not talking the God of Quran is not such God that in which that you only talk about him at the very beginning that everything can explain through that. The God of Quran is actually 
is a God of everything, even every drop of this water, according to Quran, cannot be understood without invoking God, without bringing God into your explanation. So and that's really our main position. Therefore, this idea of science can explain everything uh, without God, it's very um, exaggerated statement and it's not, in, 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 from Nursi's perspective, it's completely misguided and false statement. So that's what we're going to try to. So if you really look at it, there are data, but I'm just going to briefly show it to you and I'm not going to go through that. It's very clear data, the Pew um, you know, uh, Research Center did a survey. What you find out, essentially, um, as people yeah, you know, in terms of the conflict between religion and science, in terms of science and belief in God. Um, so you can see clearly, uh, general public, they believe much more than scientists. So it's very clear that as, as you go through the science education, this is the percentage of people who actually see who do not believe, you know, in God in any way. Or, you know, so you can see here, and in general public and in among scientists. Not only that, uh, as against that, that's amongst the general public, that's among scientists, you know, who define themselves as atheists and agnostics. And then, not only that, you, you can see as they get older, they actually become uh, more, they, they give up the faith and more likely to become an atheist. So you can see the age has that, and you can see the field as well. So this is about the scientists, among the scientists. So you see, it's a, uh, so female, I think it's the gender, do you see the gender differences? Yeah, you see, uh, men are more likely to be atheists than women, right? <laughs> among scientists. Look at the percentage. This is for uh, men that were atheists among scientists. This is a, a female. So you see the female, maybe through their compassion, their faculty, exactly. they, are, they, are <laughs> they are more likely to somehow, you know, realize. It's still the, as well, it talks about it. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, 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 it's very, very interesting. And overall, overall, is actually, you see, this map is showing us that what is the second largest religion now, and most places, it's turned out to be atheism, right now. It's actually in Europe now, atheism is the first largest religion, you know, so it's everywhere. It's a major, major problem in this regard, and I think uh, you can't really, you know, um, deny the role of science in that, and those people who use science, and in a way that we call uh, those are uh, atheist evangelists, they try to really believe in this cause and this, you know, spread this idea and to see how they can make more people to disbelieve. And this was, um, did you see this one in the UK when they had it? Did you see that? They had it, uh, I think, two, three years ago. Well, I don't know how many years ago. They, they had this the ads on the bus around in the UK. This is the UK bus, right, isn't it? <laughs> that, that was. Uh, so there is probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life, yeah. right? See, that's that thing. This is what they try. They they cannot say, they cannot speak with certainty. See, this is probably right. Because you have to, because to be absolutely certain for, Nursi says it's absolutely impossible for them to prove their case. Because to prove it, you have to go be all, beyond all the time and space, go everywhere and look for God. And if you come and say, you know, I check everywhere and every time and uh, there is no something like, some, something like that. So you can never be absolutely sure and you can see the atheists are still very skeptical even of their atheism. There's no absolute atheism in this regard. And it's really interesting, Ojan, uh, the way they are putting the opposite side, mm. like enjoy your life. There's no God, so enjoy your yeah, life. Yeah, exactly. Because so the thing that we mentioned yesterday, yeah, exactly. dirty desires yeah. versus spiritual uh, desires. Because, because the things that, you know, because the whole idea is that religion brings certain restriction and you cannot enjoy your life because their uh, sense of enjoyment is all hedonic type of enjoyments. So in a way that, like I mentioned to you when you know, the friend was saying, you go swim in the water, enjoy that. Yeah, good, you can enjoy it. But swimming in a knowledge, to me, is a thousand times more enjoyable. And economists, we say there's opportunity cost. If I go and do the biological, physical enjoyment, and I actually, I, I will give up something 
you know, intellectual, spiritual. So that is a, an opportunity, of course, of what you do. Um, now, what is the outcomes? This is one of really, really great books. If you understand what is that, is the uh, Harry Lavis. Uh, he was the former dean of Harvard College for 30 years. And uh, this is one of very good books called Excellence Without a Soul. And his argument is that basically um, modern science, like you know, an institution like Harvard, they do provide excellence, which means this is basically technical excellence. They make you to be a good engineer, good scientist, but you lose your soul. So therefore, the discussion of, remember, discussion of whether AI is going to become human or not, yeah, have you read about the discussion, the worry they have it, that AI is going to basically one day be dominating and become maybe like human? I say, really, it's not. you don't have to worry about that. The, what you need to worry about is that human is becoming like AI in a way that we are turning to robots. It's not that robots is becoming human. We already lost our human side. And essentially, we gain only the technical skills. What we do is analytical thinking, and based on algorithm, it seems like the machine or robots can do better than us. And that's the reason the people are really concerned that AI is going to take over because they don't do anything different than AI. So they don't do anything different than robots. Therefore, they're really concerned that if the robots really, you know, uh, with AI develop better, they're going to take over the world, which I think, you know, it's already happening in one way. Now, um, we're going to look at uh, Nursi in this regard. So let's see what Nursi really, what was his things, and, and I, we already discussed some, I, remember, you know, I was told with Dr. Afasan, but I will do a quick overview to really have the nurse's perspective on the issue before to go to uh, the description of the problem. So Nursi, his early life, he was really fascinated with science, to the level that he memorized science textbook. Can you imagine? He will go and actually debate with the teachers and defeat them, show that he's more knowledgeable than them of, let's say, biology, you know, chemistry, physics. You know, he was very, very much. And then, because he thought that science is a stairways to the reality, that was his initial idea. But it didn't take a long time for him to realize science has a major problem. And he realized that science come with a, a kind of poison that he almost dedicated his entire life to really fight with that. And therefore, I can't really understand how come a Nursi readers could not get this point. Because Nursi will say explicitly, his fight with two types of Tawut. Tawut is basically is the idols. One is within, is Anani, is Ana. One is an outside, is nature, a Tabia. And then what he calls the tabia, if you look at the tabia, you know, the treatise on tabia, you see he talks about material causes, chances, and the nature all together. So it's kind of the trios, okay? And he says, my entire life, it was just a fight against that. And you're telling me that those had no problem with science? What did he do, really? He was, he was in a way, that tried to see how he gets, gets this, you know, ideology to be filtered and then he can um, provide a more integrated approach to the knowledge, to his um, Harfi perspective. Now, this is things you already discussed, right? You might say, is enough, enough. I already heard about those four words. I tell you that we have been working on two words alone for eight years. And I can still say I'm, you know, I'm willing to really discuss and learn from those who want to understand those concepts. Because Norsi, I believe he was really a genius person. And I believe he will never deliberately lie because he you knows absolutely terrible things. He even did not accept the fatwa from those people to say, under circum circum circumstances, you can lie. He said, no, that is not allowed. Because there are some fatwa for that. He says, in lying is absolutely forbidden, no matter what. You speak either truth or silence. But you have no justification to lie at all. To the level, there is a story that one of his students was in a position either to lie or to say some things harm to Nursi, and he rather asked God to take his soul. He preferred to die instead of lying. In the day of court. He, he, at the court, and he died actually. His dua was accepted uh, at that time. So it's like very, very Socratic, if you really look at it, when Socrates was uh, faced with two options, either to lie or to die, he decided to get the poison and die rather than lie. Because he said, if I lie, I'm going to harm my soul. And, but my soul is a permanent. 
they cannot touch my soul. If they kill me, they're going to only harm my body. So, so therefore, this is not lying. Nursi says it took 30 years of his study, 40 years of his life to get only four concepts. So therefore, don't think that, you know, are we hearing it again and again? That's uh, four words. No, it's actually very deep words because to truly understand, internalize and apply in your life first and in your understanding takes a lot of time, a lot of time. So the concept he says is basically you need to go to the original phrase in the Masnavi, but, but this is a very short one you know, because there are four words and four statements. And four words and four statements are they're all linked together and there is a connection between every one of them. So it's basically the word is a niya, nazar, manai, harfi, and manai is ni. So uh, there are links uh, we, we briefly referred yesterday. So niya is intention. For Nursi, it's nothing more important than niya. And we know in hadith that inna man a'amalu bin niya. So everything is based on niya. Because Nursi says that basically mm, anything you want to do has to start with niya. Anything. So the niya, in a way, that's your really your desire, your goal, because then. The Niyah, he says, is the soul of the, the deed, and the soul of the Niyah is the Ikhlas, the purity in your intention. So therefore, he says, you need to look at intention. Second, Nazar. Nazar is, again, it's basically reflective. I look at it, I translate it as a reflective viewpoint, because there has to be reflection. In Arabic, Tara or Yara is different than is uh, Nazar, Yanzur, Fanzur. So Fanzur, when the Quran says that, it's basically in looking at something in a reflective way. It's not just looking to seeing, taking a picture. The camera can look and take the picture. It's not looking in that way. So in this case, it's a reflection. It's a reflective looking. And mana uh, hafi mana is me. Is again, we're going to look at that. So basically, it's to look at the creation in terms of being the sign and ayah of God. That's mana harfi. And mana is me to looking at the creation in terms of itself. Now, here is a question. Let's see, you know. Um, if you, you, know, you see, you're in the study, see whether you are this level, you understand. Do you think that Nursi is against the mana ismi? Do you think that Nursi is denying the mana ismi? No? Is it nine? See, so that's the point. So, so, no, again, uh, do you think that Nursi thinks the mana ismi is absolutely wrong? No? Yes or no? Yeah. No. See? You're not sure? No. Yeah, you think you know, she thinks the mana is wrong? And mana harfi is right only? Yeah. yeah see? It's, that's what you will see when you look at the person. It's actually, Nursi is not against the mana is me. Nursi will look at that. Nursi acknowledge there is a two side of reality. There is the harfi and ismi dimension. So the Ismi dimension is the fact. You, you cannot deny that. But Nursi is against of Mana Ismi perspective. That, that's very different things. So he's not against the Mana Ismi dimension. He's against the Mana Ismi Nazar. So in this case, that his point is the Nazar part. He's not against the Mana Ismi as a dimension. There are two different things. There's Mana Ismi and Mana Hafi as a two different dimension of their existence. And there's also two different ways of looking at the existence. If you look at the existence through the Mana Ismi perspective, that Lucy thinks that's a mistaken way. That's a wrong way. It should not be done in this way. But he doesn't have any power. We'll explain this how it is. And I think actually it refers in modern times to the philosophy of rather than the flaws of itself. Manai Ismi is referring to, uh, sorry, uh, Manai Ismi is referring to the science, mm -hmm. but the Manai Ismi perspective is referring to the philosophy of science, which is based on secular and non-God based understanding. That's good. I think that's a good way to put it. Excellent. Okay, so in this case, in Nursi, it's basically against Niya come first, that we call intention. And I really think that it has this Niya Nazar and is very much epistemic, it's about knowledge. So he's saying that the intention always comes first, but your attention is determined by, by, by your intention. And that's well established in psychology, right? So the psychologist always says that basically that a lot of things out there, remember this, um, uh, uh, what was it, the gorilla uh, experiment? 
Do you remember this? The Gordon experiment. What's the Gordon experiment, right? Yeah. The Gordon experiment in which that in psychology is things well, one known experiment I remember. So essentially, the two uh, player, two team are playing the playing the game, right? And then you're asked to count the, you know, uh, to follow one of the team and to see how many times they're passing the ball to each other. They do this experiment a lot. And you focus on one team and counting the ball. Meanwhile, in that scheme, uh, someone with the gorilla costume get inside then and actually walk around, get outside. And they ask people, did you see that? Most of them say, I never saw that. So that's what they call the you know, so in a way that the, and, and sometimes they were told that it was going to happen before the experiment. Even with that they could see. see. So how would you miss the gorilla? They're coming into that. So the point here is that when you look at some things, your attention go based on what is your intention. So you will miss the whole gorilla in the room, even even if its reality is very big, it's very visible, because your attention is not toward that. And Nursi is very clear in that, that therefore an intention is very, very important. Everything has to start with the Niyya, okay? And hojam, even like in this quantum physics, in, like very recently, that's discovered, like even you're looking, your mazar is, like even the describing the shapings of the circles of the atoms inside of the things, uh, you know, but this is actually described based on the quantum quantum physics. But even they, those kind of very tangible material things can be changed by the perspective, by the observer, by the observer's perspective. Yeah, they, they say the collapse of collapse of the wave, wave function. So basically, they the point is, yeah, they say when you perceive it, only it happen. Otherwise, it doesn't. It's, and this is one of the puzzles they cannot do why it's happening. So it explained that, but I, I they cannot really explain how it happened. Yeah, just, just so I make sure that uh, my whole dissertation is not about to crumble. Fabia uh, is and some of are a part of the ISMI perspective, right? Yes. Not the ISMI dimension? Um, no, in ISMI perspective, yes. yes okay. Yes, ISMI perspective. <laughs> yes. Uh, so again, there are two things. That's what we try to look at. There's a perspective and there's a dimension. Okay, so the point here is that in everything starts with intention. Your percep, your 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 attention goes based on your intention, and your perception is determined by your attention. Okay, so therefore it's very important that what is your attention, what is your thing. So in this case, basically, in Nursi's view, is that there are two dimensions of the reality. So there's ismi dimension and harfi dimension. So the ismi dimension. That some things is self-showing. I call self-showing. So as I think Colin Turner translates this as a, a self-referential. He translates as self-referential. Self-indicatable. Uh, self-indicatable. Self, uh, self, self uh, no, we call other indicative oh, and yeah. self-indicative. Yeah. Self, yeah. Self self indi like yeah. Right. Other indicative and what was it? I think. Self-referential and other indicators. Uh, yeah, but I put it more like, a, let's say, a lay language that's easy to me to understand. I call it self-showing. You show yourself. That's the Ismi dimension. And the Harfi dimension is God-revealing dimension, in which that you sign and you reveal something about God. So uh, that's what I put it like, basically, in a way, um, in, in Nursi and understanding. So the best example, really, I, I, I used to explain that is a traffic is a stop sign or traffic light. So, how? What is the ismi dimension? What is the halfi dimension? In traffic light. What is the ismi dimension? It is red. The ismi dimension. Uh, yeah, it is red. So it's red. And it means stop. No, no that is hard. That doesn't it's mean. It means it's, it's the halfi dimension. dimension. So the ismi. So the ismi. So the ismi. Yeah, ismi dimension is like to say. What is the size? What is it made of? What is the color? And what is the cause? So any things that you study about the physical, factual side, without mentioning anything about the meaning of it, that's all ismi dimension. So the ismi dimension is you look at it. What it tells you? I'm, you know, my color is red. So this is my shape. I'm made of the plastic. So you know, so this is ismi dimension. What about biologically? We're conditioned to think that that means danger. 
Oh, but again, the no, meaning no, side no. is a harfi. No. Whenever, whenever, whenever you talk about when you drive the meaning, that's always harfi. So. But it, can animals drive harfi meaning? But that's, they they can, of course, yeah. they could, they can, and that. But if in the footstrap for something they are designed, they could do that. So the harfi is the meaning side, but ismi is only the physical side. It's something showing its stuff that has no meaning in this regard. So how it is unfitting and incomplete to just describe this uh, as it's a red light? Yeah, well, that's what we can come back. We can come back. So first of all, there is no harfi without ismi. Because how would you get the meaning without the sign, right? So the harfi and ismi dimension are actually connected to each other. You cannot separate from each other. The ismi dimension has to come first, in which that you can see the meaning will be reflected on that one. You have to see something out there, and then from that you can drive certain meaning. So therefore, we're not denying the ismi dimension of the reality. And we're not denying the importance of the engineers, right? They would design this, right? Engineering, right? How would you look at this as an engineer? So you try to look at it in terms of like, you know, let's say use your mathematics, you use look knowledge of the material, and then say how I'm gonna design something that's durable to, you know, uh, basically give you a good, you know, traffic light there. So all of those is is me dimension. Now the hard three dimension is the meaning of that. What does red mean? What does yellow mean? What does green mean? That's the harfi dimension. Now the problem in this case, basically, um, Norsi is saying, look, he's saying, if you have, imagine that you're teaching in school, everything's about the ismi dimension for the, tra for the traffic light and the, the traffic signs, but you never mention the meaning of that. The entire education is based on the ismi of that, and no mention is for, you're forbidden to even talk about it. What is the point of this? What is the point of this education? It's completely pointless, isn't it? I mean, what will happen? Once they get out and go into the traffic, they're gonna crash. Why? Because they did not study the meaning of it. They did study the traffic light, but they did not study the meaning of it. So which means that they're not gonna, when they go and live their life, they're gonna crash. They don't know how to live it because they did not learn the meaning. So in Nusi's views, that's exactly what we're doing with the universe. The universe is no different than the, the traffic light. The universe has an embedded meaning. And if we do not read the meaning, we're going to crash. We're going to have a trouble. And we have a trouble to the level we can lose if you don't know the meaning of a red light, what's, happen, what's likely will happen? Imagine you never learn the meaning of that, you're driving a car. What will happen? Very likely you're gonna pay the price with your life, right? If not going to jail, you're gonna crash one day because you're not gonna stop and you're gonna die. See, Nursi will argue that if you don't read the Harfi perspective and read the universe, you're gonna lose your eternal life. So it's even more important than teaching the meaning of the traffic light. So, and therefore, in this regard, the essential part, basically, the creation is like traffic light, is a sign, and a sign always has a two sides. Sign as a signifier, and that is the ismi dimension, and the meaning part is a signified within the signifier. So in this case, basically, you know, uh, in the, the key part here is that try to, if you just focus on the signifier part, we don't really see what is signified in that one, you're gonna miss the whole meaning. So Nursi thinks that everything in the universe has two dimension and has a meaning. So what we have done is, with the secular approach, we reduce the entire reality to the material, to the ismi dimension, and we are even forbid people to even mention the existence of the Harfi dimension. It's like telling them, you're not allowed, go and be great engineer, design a traffic light, but you're not allowed to mention the meaning of traffic light. You're not allowed to teach anyone to know the meaning of that. This is complete nonsense in this regard, Nursi will say. And therefore he will say, just, he will say, trash it. 
actually. He says that I loaded my mind with this type of things, but I had to burn them out to get the meaning out of that. Otherwise, it just become a burden like what the Quran mentioned, donkey carrying books with absolute no uh, value of that. Yes? Yeah, with anthropology, they go over this exact thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and one thing they do, as in, I think what they were teaching us last year, last year in university, they split meaning, as in over here, into a lot of the PSG and the index. So they split this signifier, signifier relationship mm -hmm. into three things. So one thing called an icon, one thing called an index, mm -hmm. and one thing called the symbolic meaning. Mm -hmm. And they say that iconic and indexical meanings which are things that look like the traffic light, such as, uh, you know, you look at um, physical reality, how things are properties of things, those are objective things, and those are objective meanings. But when you get to symbolic meanings, mm -hmm. which are things like... Oh, that's symbolic, that's subjective. Yeah, they're completely <laughs> subjective. Yeah. So the whole idea... Is but that that's very, that's why we're going to, that, that, that's, uh, they call it uh, bifurcation. So the idea of really... In a way, that starts with the Descartes, essentially, to really have the things of mind separate of the things of reality and talk this as a real, the other one is subjective. That is a very, very you know, common approach and it's an, and it's an actually a very wrong way to look at that. Now, the other way Nursi look at it is actually Mane, Harfi, Mane, Ismi. Since it's like, now look at this. What is, what is Mane, Harfi, what is Mane, Ismi? See, that's the test to see whether you really got it or not. See, it took, that's why it took 30 years, I for Lucy. <laughs> so you're looking at the mirror. So when you look at the mirror, what is the harfi, what is the ismi dimension, and what is the harfi, and what is the ismi perspective? Yes? Is the reflection and harfi? No. Harfi is the perspective, ismi is the mirror. No, in terms of looking at the mirror, I'm talking talk about the mirror. When you look at the mirror, so what, do you see? what is no? What is the ismi dimension of the mirror? What is the harfi dimension of what is uh, of the mirror? Ismi is what it shows you back. Okay. The visual image, and when you reflect on that and drive the meaning that oh, it's you what you're seeing, mm. it's the harfi. Or more simply, when I look at the mirror, I'm just seeing. Two eyes, one nose, one mouth, and hair is an ismi. But I, when I look at the mirror, I see as a human being, myself. So mm -hmm. that see, see, so that's very so. Actually, in this is exact topic is discussed in Barva like This is the that one. Nursi gave this one, and he says you can change the ismi and harfi the way you look at it as well. Depends on how you look at that. Okay. So and he gave it that in a way. It's like if you read it, you will. If you don't pay attention carefully, you're gonna be confused at what does it really mean. Essentially, if you really look at here, uh, let's say if I'm gonna look at the glasses. If I study the glasses of the mirror, what is made of, how much it costs, what is the shape, what is the size, this is all ismi dimension. And that's basically fine, no problem. I can study the glasses, I can have, be engineered to see how you can make the glasses, what, how much, as an economist, how much it costs you, that's ismi dimension. But when I look at this, if I say there's nothing beyond that, that means I'm denying the Harfi dimension. The Harfi dimension is that that glasses work as a mirror mm -hmm. that basically reflects something within itself. That is the Harfi dimension. So in this case, if I look at the glasses as the glasses, then I will see the glass only that the glass is a three dimension. But if I look at the mirror to see my reflection, that my reflection is the meaning reflected in the glasses that become the Harfi dimension. So I look at through the Harfi perspective and see the Harfi dimension. But the problem here, if I say there is no Harfi dimension, there's only glasses, then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just study even the reflection in terms of the glasses. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna look at the sources. I'm gonna say this is, is all, there's nothing but glasses. Or you say, but I see the images that I say, let me look at the piece and see how does the image emerge from this material part. See, because I'm looking from, I deny the Harfi dimension. I'm looking from the Ismi dimension only. Because I only accept the physical reality. I do not accept any other. It's, 
um, uh, Harfi is always metaphysical. It's always, again, I, I, I use a metaphysical, but some people complain and say don't use it because it's come up with really a lot of uh, connotation in the Western philosophy. His point is like, better to use, you know, in a way, the angelic and malakut dimension, because harfi is very much linked to the malakut dimension. And that's something, meaning. Meaning is actually, is a, Meaning is something created as well, is another dimension of what is that, okay? So in this case, so again, depends on how you look at that. Now, look at this. Mm -hmm. So sorry, Bilal, for the example of mirror, the looking at it as just a glass mm -hmm. from a materialistic perspective, it's the milk side is glass itself. Okay, yes. But the medical side of thing, because everything yeah. has two sides, okay, milk okay, and okay, yeah, okay. Uh, which is invisible, referring to That's meaning thing. and okay, the half, yes. So you can look at... The glasses, in this case, your perspective to look at the glasses, the glass has two dimensions as well. So one is what is visible to you, that's the me, but there's one thing beyond that is Malekut dimension. The Malekut is the part that's basically that the reality is taking the shape from which. Yes. Is it fair to say that real purpose is Always a part of money, Harfi? Real purpose. So I would say it's fair to say it's a part of money, Harfi is, uh, uh, it's always is about the meaning. So you're looking for the meaning. But the meaning, as Descartes claim, is not something coming from your mind. The meaning is there. You try to derive, extract from that. But if you read the Descartes, his argument is the meaning is subjective you give into that. Mm -hmm. Nursi will not accept that. Nursi will say, no, the meaning does exist there. So you have the way to learn the language to extract that meaning. It's not to add, to give your meaning. Because you know, relativism will say as so everything is a relativist that you just give the meaning that kind of mind. That's very Cartesian way of looking at the knowledge. But Nursi will say no. The meaning is makhluk is created, and everything has the meaning side. So you, manay harfi means your intention is to see the meaning, manay harfi perspective. So because manay is me, perspective is that your intention to see the manay is me dimension only. So you look at the, the glasses, you don't look at the mirror, you don't look at the reflection, you only look at the mana is me. So mana hanfi, you're actually, when you look at the mirror, do you even see the glasses? No, why? Because you don't look at the mirror as the glasses, you look at the mirror in terms of its meaning of reflecting something, therefore as soon as you look at it, you just see your reflection. Why? Because your intention is towards the meaning and reflection is that not towards the Ismi dimension. So Mane Harfi is all about, you can look at the tree, now you will see the tree normally. The best one is to not even see the tree, as soon as you see the tree, see the meaning of that. But normally, for like, let's say, initial uh, kind of lay person like us maybe, you will, when you see first, what come to your attention is the Ismi dimension. But if you really get advanced, you will not see the Ismi dimension. As you look at the mirror, you will never see the glasses. You directly see the reflection there. And you say, oh, look at this, yo, what, a, what amazing images, you know? Well, I also say that because it's fulfilling a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, there, and that, like, fulfilling a purpose is a part of the meaning of the thing. Whereas that's where I see, I mean, it, it might not be, it might not be the same thing, it might not be a part of it, but the, so teleology is coming back Good. in philosophy. Yeah, but that's exactly, that's very, very true. Talos, remember, well, I'm going to refer to that one, the Aristotle's, that's one of the essential things is that there has to be purpose. Without the purpose, nothing can exist. Remember the four causes that he mentioned? Yeah. So the final cause is the purpose, the talos. Mm -hmm. There is no talos now in science. So it's essentially, the tal this is mana and harfi is to really yeah. read the talos in the creation. Yes. Because, okay. yes. because that's why the reason I say the talos because Nursi will say the one who created this intentionally injected some meaning inside that, there is nothing meaningless. 
So try to pay attention to the meaning and you read that. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why you will yes, say that. That's what I'm yes. saying. Apart from that perspective, Quran actually is attracting our attentions and gazes to the universe, to the, you know, like all these mosquitoes, moon, and stars, and all these, you know, creatures, but not because of the glasses, but because of the reflective point that they are referring to, right? Exactly, exactly. Actually, uh, the way Nursi put it, he said that. God created the universe in an amazing way, uh, then the meaning that he embedded in the universe, he extract this meaning and compile in the Quran. So in a way that the Quran, reading the entire universe, therefore Nursi called it that two Quran, one is Quran Kareem, one is Quran Kabir. So Quran Kabir is the universe. So, and therefore, <laughs> You know, when I actually, you know, I, I, therefore I say, so one of the things Nursi mentioned, and, and most Nursi readers don't get it that way, uh, Nursi mentioned the Arabic has to be mandatory. And the Arabic wajib means has to be mandatory. And unfortunately, Nursi readers think that uh, Darsana is a fulfillment of a meditative of Zahra, but they don't really think that Arabic should be mandatory for those who stay in Darsana. And they think that you read the Risale, you can understand it, but I think Nursi is is absolutely, is not, you know, having us to read his books to understand what he thinks. He wants us to read Quran to understand what Quran thinks about it. And you cannot do it without knowing of Arabic. It's absolute must. Every educated believers and every particularly educated Nusi readers must know Arabic and must directly get connected to the Quran. This is not an, an optional. And this is very clear in the Nursi's, Nursi's projects, in Medicine of Zahra, it's a whole education project. You can do that. Because when I read Quran, which, you know, after learning some Arabic, I can't, uh, you know, show me any page of Quran in which that it doesn't talk about the universe. It doesn't really give you an Harfi perspective. Show me anything. So I can take you from the very first ayah reveal, the Surah Al-Alaq, till get me, I have my favorite Surah on that to talk about, I could not find any surah in the Quran will not talk about this. You cannot find any single surah which doesn't talk about that. So therefore, as you read the Quran, you will actually read the universe. And you have to read those two together. And that's because that's the whole purpose behind everything's in the universe. So therefore, to me, you can't have those two knowledge to be separated. If the universe created with certain meaning, and if the Quran is actually just the summary of the meaning in the universe that you have to really find a way to read together. So that's the, that's the reason. Uh, now, look at this. So the whole point, again, same things. Uh, so just as mirrors are not the source of reflection, but simply the means through which we see reflections, beings are not the source of their properties and outcomes. They are just the means through which we experience certain results or certain effects. See, so in this case, the whole point, Nursi is saying, look, you know, it's like as if you're looking at the mirror, seeing the reflection, but you're saying, don't talk about what is behind this reflection. This is pointless. How come you're going to see something reflected in a mirror? And you say, you're forbidden to talk to something behind that. Nursi is saying, how come? This, every reflection must have a source. And then what, what the science secular perspective will say, they say, oh, this reflection has come from the arrangement of those glasses this way. Don't talk about anyone seeing, you know, standing behind that. So just explain through this glasses. Let's just say this is complete nonsense. Why? Because the properties of the glasses can never tell you about the reflected images in glasses. Yes, the reflections is happen through the glasses, but not from the glasses. So Nursi says, use your mind and understand the glass cannot produce all this kind of reflected images and thinks about the source of reflection in the creation. That's in a way that Nursi's, the whole Nursian project is all about taking us to the source of everything that's reflected in the creation. And therefore, when I read Heidegger, when, you know, I really you know, like a lot in a way because this is one of the your first mind is saying, look, you know, you look at the being, there is a meaning in the being. Don't look at it as just an it's a, you know, instrument. There is meaning that 
are revealing or unveiling itself in the existence. Though he, he failed to get the meaning, but he actually, you know, in a way that he is the first guy telling us, look, the universe is a book. There is a meaning, but it just didn't know how to read it. But he spent his entire life to convince us this is not a piece of paper, this is a book has some meaning inside, and a very important meaning. But how to read, you couldn't do that, because you cannot if you don't really get the divine revelation. And that's why when the Quran came first, Iqra is all about read the meaning, read the meaning in the being. So, and that's, I think, is like taking us to the soul. So, essentially, if we look through those concepts, the problem, so we see everything has two dimensions, the ismi and harfi dimension. Ismi dimension is the apparent cause, the factual part. The hasmi is a mirk dimension. The harfi dimension is a malekut dimension. It's about basically um, uh, the, what is the true cause or the only cause that manifested in the ismi dimension, okay? The problem is not ismi and harfi dimension. The problem is Ismi perspective and denial of the Harfi perspective. Okay, so in this case, the Ismi perspective, when you have it, basically you say there's no meaning, no you know reflection, um, then you just say everything's glasses. And Nursi think the solution is to really have the Harfi, um, the Harfi perspective. They can show you both dimension. They can show you the full reality. We don't deny the Ismi dimension. We don't say, no, no, physics is not important. Don't study physics. No, we're not saying that, actually. We're saying that physics is absolute must. You have to study. But you have to also look at the meaning side of what you study in physics. So again, uh, it's back to our metaphor. So we're saying that, yes, physical side, the factual side about the traffic light is important, but do not deny the meaning of that. There's not just an object without any meaning. It's complete nonsense to say that. And it's saying apply to every single being in the universe in a way that if you think that you're traveling in a journey in the universe, this AI gave me this description. I had actually, AI helped me a lot. I give you, I'll show you some of the images from the AI that do that. Say like, as if I'm traveling in the universe and that there's a traffic light there, as basically if you don't, you know, uh, recognize the meaning of that, they're gonna crash when you travel in this journey um, in, in the universe. So again, um, in summary, so essentially we look at Ismi and Harfi. So um, you can have intention in Ismi is a secular intention. So it means that your niya is to look at the Ismi dimension and to define the reality based on this one alone. In other words, I'm going to look at the traffic light not in terms of the meaning. I'm going to only look at the physical side. That's the intention. So the problem starts with the intention. Then, yes? Just a little criticism. Yes. We read in one of our Holocaust, in the first day I, uh, I remember, the, the 12 words, which is talking about you know, a king gives the Quran, mm. the book of Quran, to, to two artists, one of the European artists, mm. and the other one is the scholar of Islam. And the European artist, because he's just an artist, he intentionally and consciously uh, is only looking at the diamonds and the material of the book and you know the style of writing this and that and gives a very nice paper about how it is it is written in, in a materialistic way in, a, in this decoration and other stuff. But the scholar of Quran, scholar of Islam looks at its meaning inside, you know, what it refers to. So I just remember from this analogy from this you know, actually kind of, the twelfth uh, world is Twelfth word is the best uh, uh, practical topics in terms of comparing Ismi and Harfi. The twelfth word is all about Ismi and Harfi in an allegory. And the, but what allegory used there? Because most of the time, it took time for me to really know even what is the allegory used there. What is the allegory used there? Is it the book allegory? Is it the book allegory used that? No, it's not no. the book allegory. What is the allegory? It is the Quran allegory. But it's not a book, it's the Quran allegory. Make big difference, which means the universe is not a book. The universe is the Quran. So when the universe is Quran, then this universe is sacred as the Quran is sacred. See? So he did not say it's a book, he says the Quran. 
So we know how we Muslims that we have a respect for the Quran. We don't put in ground, we have we put in a high place, we have enormous respect for that. And Nusi is saying the universe is absolutely has the equivalent you know uh, sacred, sacred value as the Quran. And therefore he's not saying is the book is the Quran that. Yeah, I think he used also the word the vast Quran of the universe, yes, Quran Kabir, Quran Kabir, this is the Quran Kabir. So again, the Ismi one is basically the problem start with intention, the secular, and then the attention follows that. So attention is toward the Ismi dimension and Ismi perspective. The intention to see the Ismi dimension, and the perception you only see the physical dimension. That's all. In the Harfi one, intention is is a Tawhidi, meaning that you know this is God made and God made some meaning, some messages on eye of God. So you start with that. That's a telos, that's the purpose, okay? So then attention goes toward the harfi dimension, actually. And in a way that you even, almost you don't see the ismi dimension. Why? Because the whole purpose is a harfi dimension. Okay? And then the perception, you see both of them, but it's actually you focus more on the harfi dimension. So therefore, for you, when you're talking about the traffic light, it's all about the meaning. Make sure everyone gets the meaning. When you give the lecture on that, you're not going to focus on the, physical, uh, the, the ismi dimension. So that is the difference. OK, I think we can um, stop here, right? Uh, yeah. what, is, what, what is the time? What is our, um, any, it's 1.15. OK, any questions? Any comments? So um, as I mentioned, we are just in 26. We still have uh, yes, 60 more slides. Um, but uh, this is the very first part of the lectures. But then we're going to talk about the real problem in terms of separation of creation, creator, you know, and, and give some examples on that based, based on those concepts. So today's thing was to really is all about Ismi and Harfi in a way to really get it, to see how it works. And, you know, so you thought that you really knew, but I think based on the question I asked, it's, you still, we still needed to really get digested very well. And then we will focus on the more practical side later on. Yes? Um, is there any way to get to the Harfi without going through the Ismi? Uh, no, I think so. Uh, you can't get it. What I'm saying is that without the Harfi dimension, there's no Ismi dimension. And without the Ismi dimension, there's no Harfi dimension. Like, uh, you know, let's say, you look at this in the Harfi dimension. How would you look at it? I mean, what is, how would you read this as in, in terms of the Har Harfi perspective? You look at this, what is that? You can read this one on Harfi perspective. Like, this is a book right. written in Harfi language. Can you read it? Can you read anything? No? Don't see anything? Maybe? I can actually write a whole book on that one. Uh, it's yeah, already, yeah, but I'm, I'm saying that if, is, because you said that um, you, have to, you kind of have to go through the Ismi in order to be able to yeah, the, If, if there's no Ismi dimension, means if there's no water here, how could you read it? Because to me, that mentions about the physical reality of the existence. If it doesn't exist at all, right. how could you read it? So presuming somebody like, for instance, this is, I guess, kind of linked to the epistemology lectures that we had the past two days. If somebody has no sensory experience, then is there no way for that person to ever get to the heart? Oh, oh, that's good. I, I think if you don't have any sensory one, uh, it will become very difficult, if not impossible. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I, imagine that God only created you as a soul with the mind only, and there is no universe. And then you get the message telling you, how would you know that? You have to just accept it as is. That's all. You can't read up. What is the way for you to, so the key part is how, you know, without witnessing what God is telling you, the only thing is you just have to accept it. But now, when you witness what you're told, that you have a way, you have a way to affirm it. That's why, you know, Muslims are shahada, that you bear witness. So you bear witness that now you experience that. If you have absolutely no experience of that, like, you know, God is telling you, you know, I'm all powerful, all knowing, all beautiful, but you never see any things in terms of what he does in power. Don't think you have to just accept it as is, which means, you can't really have a tahqiq, you have to, you can just accept taqlid and just accept aziz. Yeah. That's the reason, remember. Is that, is that the belief we had in the instance of the Qadu Bagha? 
Yeah, but no, I think I think the, to me this this is remind this is remind me in terms of the angels. That when angels was asked when they say we don't know that what really make human to be superior to angels because angels do not have some experience that we have it. Therefore they cannot know. Like when in our understanding angels do not eat and drink, right? So if they don't eat and drink, they don't have any understanding of eating and drinking. And how could they really, you know, know what does it mean in terms of, let's say, risk, in terms of uh, the pleasures in the risk of... They, they, yeah, they don't know it, as we do. They can still be thankful, right. but they cannot be as thankful as we are. And imagine you're really thirsty and you drink water. Now, your appreciation comes fully from your hearts. Mm -hmm. Because you know what does it mean? What is the value of water for you when you're really thirsty? It's not much work for you. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, it, it be. exactly. But, but again, so it gives you opportunity to. So, so to me, it's like without sensual experience at all. I don't know. I think this has become really, real, real problem too. I mean, you could have it, but as a taqlid, not as a taqlid. You just have to accept it, whatever you've been told. So therefore, you know, um, the ismi that I mentioned is really, we're not denying that, it's really necessary. That on which that you can see the harfi dimension is being manifested. Otherwise, the Quran doesn't, wouldn't refer to ismi dimension, yeah. which is about the star, yeah. moon, and this and that, specifically in their names. Yeah, it's actually, you know what, this what I say, like, in a way that, uh, you know, the Quran is saying, you know, uh, whatever I tell you, look at my action in the universe, if it makes sense to you, accept it. Otherwise, because you say, okay, you tell me, but how can I know? It's true. I remember, uh, we talk about a miracle, right? The Prophet Ibrahim's case. The Prophet Ibrahim is one of really amazing figure. If you look at his truly Harfin prophet, you know? And his point, he, is, he says, in one case, he says, he was talking to God. He says, I want to know how you resurrect. So he was talking to God. He says, I want to know how to resurrect. And Allah says, don't you believe? Uh, what did he say? He said, I believe, but I want to increase my yaqeen. I want to increase my certainty. No, it's Ibrahim and Islam. Ibrahim and Islam. And, and then, and then, and then, and then what happened? Uh, Allah didn't say, if I said so, that's all. Don't you know I have an infinite power? I could do whatever I say? He didn't say that. He could have said that. He could say, look, logically things. If I have infinite power, can I do it? Yes, I could. So why are you still asking for that? But what Allah said, Allah said, okay, take four birds, train them to yourself, slaughter them into the pieces, cut them into the pieces, put on to the top of the different mountains, and call them to yourself. He did it. It works. The birds came back to the life, and he saw that. Now, when I read that one, you know what was my reading? I said, uh, that means to have yaqeen, you have to see a miracle. But can we see a miracle? See, because Ibrahim al the Quran is very clear saying that Ibrahim al said, I want to really, I want to have yaqeen how? I really want to see the miracle, right? But can we actually see a miracle? See, so, and that's actually in, in you know, uh, Nursi will say, everything's are miracles. Yeah. He called it mujizat al-qudr. So everything are the miracle. But it depends on really, it's just, it's a, I, I call, I say there are two types of miracle. There are regular miracle and there are exceptional miracle. But there is absolutely nothing but miracles. Because what does miracle mean? This is a miracle. Why? Because to actually combine a hydrogen and oxygen, get a water is absolutely beyond the power and knowledge of any single human being. And if entire humanity come together, they cannot make it. So if you drink water, that doesn't come from hydrogen and oxygen. That comes directly from the infinite power. And it cannot happen without him to really intervene and create that. So in this case, miracle means in Arabic is basically emojis, it means that to be ajis, ajis. That means you're powerless to do some things. Like, let's say, if I now say, you know, I remember one time I was discussing with one of atheist friends, he said, okay, does God exist? Yes. Does he hear us now? Yes. Okay, he says, I'm going to ask him to create a, a, you know, a fly in from this, he had the bottle of water like this. He said, I'm going to ask, close my eyes, give him two minutes, and I want him to create a fly out of this water here. He says, since he hears us, since he has a power, and since the fly cannot come out of this water, 
If he created, I'm gonna believe it right away. And he, you know, and he closed his eyes, was making fun of them, and then wait for two minutes. He opened his eyes and said, "There's no flies. That means there's no God. Because if he hears us, if he could do that, and if he didn't do that, that means he's not here. There is no God that you're just making up." I asked him, "Okay, I said, okay, tell me what you mean by by, by miracle. What does miracle mean? Miracle is an extraordinary right? What you asking for? You're asking for a fly." Don't you see that thousands fly, millions of millions fly around you? Or aren't they all miracles? So you're saying that you're not accepting all these existing miracles? And you're just saying, oh, I want to have one additional miracle on demand. So in reality, if miracles is something to be extraordinary, every single living being is a miracle. Every single droplet of water is is a miracle because it's beyond your power and the power of anyone to make it. Miracle is just about something happening that's impossible to duplicate. That's all. But you know, when God makes the miracles in a regular way, that you start to take it for granted. You see it as just a normal, natural, but not nothing is natural. Everything is a miracle, miraculous. So therefore, when they use this. You know, natural words, I really, I don't know what the words I should find for that. It's very secular concept when you say something's a natural. It's, there is nothing natural. It's come from the ideology of nature, the philosophy of nature. So it's not really a true expression. You know, in one of your articles about water, you mentioned uh, a gap. There's a specific scientific name for it, as if it's described when you put the name. Uh, while they are explaining the result part, the effect part, uh, combining with the hydrogen and oxygen, so it becomes a water yeah. sim simply. So, but there's a gap between the nature of the hydrogen and oxygen and also the nature of the water, which is totally the opposite to each other. So there's a, even like... Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that's, that, again, I, you know, I was really, to me, since everyone knows water very well, I was very fascinated with that because it's really, you know, the very simple things because we're now we look in education, I say, how, are we, how am I supposed to really know what is water? And how am I supposed to teach my kids what is water? Now the science says water is something consists of hydrogen and oxygen, which means that water is caused by hyd two hydrogen, one oxygen, or water is created when two hydrogen and one oxygen combine together, okay? But I say, okay, is it that true really? Then when you go to science, the science says, okay, I say, what is hydrogen, what is oxygen? The science says, actually, hydrogen and oxygen <coughs> has two different properties. And oxygen is very explosive, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and when normally hydrogen and oxygen come together, it can cause a big explosion, okay? So, but ironically, <coughs> when hydrogen and oxygen come together, something emerges, they call water, there are properties of water. The very first one is a water is a fluid, right? The water of the water is neither with hydrogen nor with oxygen. Where it comes from? They don't know. And there are many other amazing, unique properties of water if you study waters, and you cannot trace them to the either hydrogen or oxygen. When you ask scientists to say where well, how did this come from, you know what they came up with? They say, oh, this is an emergent properties. They call emergent properties. So then you say, what is emergent property? They say, you know, when those two th come together always, we observe something new emerge out of nowhere. You see, is it that different than when you get the hat out of the head and then you find in the head there is a rabbit? As we know, does this you know, magician do that? And you saw this magical. So is this magic going on here? And I call it this is hocus pocus. That's why really I call this is not. A, I change this uh, emergent property. I say you better to call it hocus pocus property, yeah, mm -hmm. because where it come from, yeah, it's there is no explanation. Just naming that doesn't change the reality or doesn't tell me any explanation. Because better tell me that something come out of nowhere. We don't know what it is. But when they call emergent properties that you think as if, oh, you know, yeah, the science explain it. Science tell us that now, what I'm reading that, they say this is not about water. They say every single thing in the universe has emergent properties. 
even at subatomic level. I read it since in his one quantum physicist, he got Nobel Prize in his will checks, it's one of really very good books. He says, what a, the book he wrote, A Beautiful Question. That's the title of the book, it's a very good book. In that book he argued, he says that in a quantum, in a quantum when they do uh, physical experiments, you put certain uh, particles in the experiment, and then when, you, when they explode, you count the particle come out of that one, has way more than what you put it there. He gave an example like as if you put like two green or and two yellow apple, then you get two green, two yellow, two uh, you know red apple, some banana. Where did it come from? Oh, he said this is emergent properties. They use the exact same thing as well. Has nothing to do with what you enter in experiment, something completely new. And new see, we're going to mention tomorrow, inshallah, that is Ibada, creation out of nothingness. And Nursi says that Ibda is something happening all the time. And he explicitly rejects this materialist ideology that nothing can be creating from nothingness and nothing go to nothingness. He said this is constant law of God to create everything out of nothing and to send everything to nothingness. It's something happening all the time. That's why he calls it Ibda. And even if you really look carefully, he will say that, he will say, everything's about the water, you will have it. All the property are coming from nowhere, except the basic particles, that is the, let's say, atoms, electron, protons. But he says, if you read carefully, he will say even those are always going to nothingness and coming to existence. That Ibda is always behind Insha. So his words, you use the, those Ibda and Insha. So there is no, there is no Insha without Ibda. It's not like, God, with the Big Bang, you get all these particles and everything is just the arrangement of the existing particle. Nursi says those particles also are constantly being renewed. That's the Qayyum and that is the, uh, in a way, that the renewal of the entire, and this is very much exactly, in line with what the quantum physics is telling us yeah, right now. So, so fitting his the book, small book on nature, cause and effect. You know, like the, the cause and effect relationship. Actually, the the science, in the way the science is explaining that, like causes are affecting, giving effect to this uh, to this uh, you know something special particle. But actually, you know, as it describes between the cause and effect in that relationship, the thing is only about the coming together in the same chain. Uh, not necessarily kind of a, a creation, but just a correlation, yeah. just a linking. So therefore, yeah, Nursi is very clear, yeah, yeah. So that's, as uh, Edmund mentions, Nursi is very strong on that one. There is, Nursi believes there is no causation, there is only association. Uh, and, and I will say, I actually, I, 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 I think recently I tried to revise that. I say, you should say there is no causation, there is only creation. Because, Everything, every moment is being created. So creation is constant things. So I, I used to say that I think in some of my writing I say that there is only association, but I think I came to the point to say the best way to look at it that constant creation, nothing but constant creation. And there's no causation but creation. So therefore, if you want to understand anything, you cannot make sense of it without creator. Because you can absolutely, you can never drink a droplet of water without creator to constantly create it for you. And so, and, and therefore, if you want to understand what is water, you have to bring God into your explanation. We'll mention, inshallah, more on this tomorrow. Any, any other questions? Tired enough? Huh? So, so I hope this somehow, uh, you know, meet your expectation. Huh? Or was it repetitive? of what you already heard? Huh? Okay. okay. So we will inshallah go more deep on this one and particularly the, the thing you mentioned, this I call the main problem separation of creation <laughs> and creation. Um, so we're gonna start with an exercise again. Okay. Um, so and to see make sure that we really digest the food. Um, the exercise is uh, from uh, Bertrand Russell. Um, Bertrand Russell, is that, um, if you know, he was a um, 20th century mathematician. Uh, I think he got Nobel Prize. I don't know in which area he got Nobel Prize uh, because math, they don't give it. Uh, and he was also a very famous atheist. 
Okay, so uh, he famously says that believing in God is like believing there is a teapot is steaming and hot and orbiting the sun and try and prove that I'm not. Okay, look at this one. I'm little teapot steaming and hot I'm orbiting the sun, try to prove that I'm not. So he says that really believe in God is like believing in teapot in the solar system. You can neither prove it nor disprove it. So it's completely up to you to, you know, accept or not accept it. But he said, as a scientist, the best position you can take it is to be agnostic. So it's another word to say, we don't know. And in a sense that you could believe in anything you want, but I cannot believe in it because there is no proof for it. Okay, so that is his things. Um, what do you think? This is analogy and his way of questioning and saying that science is based on proof, evidence. Faith is based on accepting something that is impossible to prove it. And, you know, I heard from a lot of people, they will say, yeah, Iman is Iman bil ghaib. You believe in something that is non, not visible. That's like we know and that's what uh, we describe it, Iman. So, what do you think? You know, someone like Russell, when he says that it's, it's no proof, no evidence, how would you, you know, accept? So it's your choice, but you cannot really be scientists if you bring that because science is all about having empirical evidence for what you, you know, uh, believe in it as a knowledge. So do you think that's in this regard that concept of God is out of science that cannot be part of scientific knowledge because it can't be empirically tested and it doesn't really meet the criteria as we have it for other scientific knowledge and it's purely is purely subjective and it's up to individual whether depending on whatever let's say the book or the leader or the prophet whatever they believe that bring it to them so ultimately so no one saw God and no one really can show God anywhere so and therefore it's really uh, in a way that it's just a matter of belief not a matter of proof would you agree with that? Hmm? Yeah, Shakir, it seems like you want to say something. Does it bother you this, or you think it's okay? Uh, because some people are it's... proud of believing without evidence. They say, you know, that's really what makes a believer to be different. So I believe in it because that's what really I will be, let's say, rewarded because I believe in something that's not visible. But therefore, I'm going to be rewarded accordingly. So do you think that's really proof and evidence are something necessary or is something unprovable? No, I think there's, there's maybe like maybe two ways you could come at this. So the first would be like to, I guess, focus on his example and try to explain the differences between the actual specific teapot and our conceptualization of who our master panel is. But what, what he's getting at, I think, is a lot of the term, which is he's basically saying if you believe in something that you can't prove or disprove, and so therefore, we're not going to regard it as scientists. But what he means is that we can't, he, what he, he's saying is that you can't prove this scientifically. Right? You can't prove this empirically. Correct. So he's- Is he right? He's already brought a standard oh, okay. by which we can determine what's true, what's, what's not true, what exists and what doesn't exist. Oh. So, so you think that to use science as a, as a kind of a, a threshold is not right? That's what is your objection? I think his claim is that the only way you can prove things to be true or false is scientifically, or using science. Uh -huh. I don't think that's... that's oh, okay. So you think that believing in God is... Um, but do you think that believing in God somehow analogously similar to believing in something like uh, an object orbiting in the solar system? Yeah, so it's of course not, because he's, he's saying that there's no proofs, but there are. There are. Okay. Yes, Brian. Um, I was just reading something 
that's something to be watched out for eventually. Um, for example, if you like, um, look at YouTube, mechanics and fixing bikes, and sometimes I'd, I'd have a tool that would work perfectly and turn the screw, let's say, for example, I'd have turned it, I wouldn't turn it, so I'd have to get another tool. So I think the premise of this is that, like Chad mentioned, if it's pulling you into a playing field which works sometimes but it doesn't work all the time, there are other tools you can use which is ignoring or not giving any validation to, which we obviously as Muslims have access and believe in. What is that? Um, what is the other tool? Is the Quran, is the Quran and the Quran? The Quran as well as spirituality uh, and uh, if he ignores. But spirituality is this an objective thing or is it a completely subjective personal experience? Huh? Like, I mean, Quran is again, uh, you can question the same thing about God, you can question about the Quran as well. I mean, because how do you, what is your proof that Quran is from God? You know? Because if you cannot even prove God <coughs> Himself, how would you prove that God sent you Quran? So don't you, think, don't you think we have to start from God and then we can come to Quran? Because someone does the, if you do not believe in God forget about the book because there cannot be any book anyway if there's no God yeah. so you have to start with God first but key the question here is this some things an evidence based and can be really proven or something just blind acceptance without really you know having convincing compelling you know evidence so that's really, that's, that's very, 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 very essential, really key part, because uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, many people really, they have the red cross, so I think they got those arguments and they really become more suspicious because they say, well, ah, I think it's, it looks like they're right, really, yeah, we can prove it then, you know, it's just up to you, how do we know it's really, it does exist? Yes? I have a question. Is um, satisfying your, satisfying? being satisfied intellectually and for example you mentioned some people are okay to just believe they don't need to be satisfied intellectually other people need a combination of both um, a spiritual experience is enough um, I'm not really sure I'm definitely having this question so, so you're saying that don't look at this as a subject, a matter of uh, mind look at it a matter of soul if you can spiritually so, yeah. yeah. which is what I feel like and this example is ignoring, which is that there are other ways to reach at the conclusion. That but what is the other way? That's um, the question. Feel the heart. Oh, feel the heart. Well, feeling the heart is like, a, it will be very hard to universalize. Because I can always say it's your, could be your personal deception. Because you cannot show me any uh, you know, evidence. and. You could say, I have a karama, or I have seen this, and I experienced that. But mm -hmm. I could say that's what you will define from Islamic way. Go and ask, read the story of, let's say, Buddhists. And so you see, they will have a quite similar spiritual experience now. What would you say? If your spiritual experience is the basis for that, then it will become very difficult for me to know that's really whether their concept of God is true versus your concept of God. because. They get it through that as well. I mean, actually, if you go and look at those, you know, uh, some Buddhists, they go through a certain process. It is really not quite different than our Sufis in terms of their spiritual experience. Which is like that combination of both. Oh, a combination of both. Ibrahim Sani. Um, I mean, going back to possible, what we were talking about before, what you were mentioning about how cannot explain with empirical or evidence looking at the ismi of objects uh -huh. trying to explain you, you cannot explain the existence of things just by the properties that make them up uh -huh. so necessarily they have to have been caused they, they have to have been brought into existence for them to exist otherwise you cannot explain why anything in the world exists uh -huh. which is a, a view that, uh, uh, and as a result God or necessary beings or Necessarily exists. Wajibul wujud. Mm -hmm. Wajibul wujud. Necessary. 
So you think, then what do you, if you uh, come up with uh, an alternative analogy, what will be your analogy for your concept of God and knowing of God? If you somehow dislike this analogy and say, this doesn't make sense because I have something that actually in a way I can really, you know, know through, let's say, the Harfi perspective, right? Look in the meaning of creation. So, what would be your concept? What would be your knowledge? Can you imagine any other analogy that basically you can challenge Russell and say, look, you know, you got it wrong, really. That's not a good one. The God that I believe is not like believing in a teapot in a solar system, believing in something else like this. So, any analogy? But how, if you get women analogy is that you come up with some things metaphorically, you try to really make the point that do you want to convey. So in his case, he uses teapots as an analogy in saying that essentially God is something not provable. So it's just a matter of belief. But if we say, no, it's not true, what could be our analogy? And anyone remembers, Nursi has amazing analogy actually on that one, and it has really, really challenged Russell's analogy in a very, very, you know, clever way. Yes, Shaki, you were gonna say something? Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, this was, it was earlier, um, I think somebody walked past outside, so the light was on, but I, the eyes, so I saw that coming through the door, but I, I couldn't see the light bulb, but I saw the rays. Oh, so you see the signs. The the okay, good. So you so what what we you know that's so you're saying that there are signs and I my understanding uh, my belief in God is based on the signs of God, right? He's not visible by his there is his marks everywhere. I can see him through his marks on the things, right? Mm -hmm. But what would be your analogy if we use that? What is the the, the level of this? See, this is Nursi's and response to that. What is that? Uh, Nursi is saying believing in God is like believing in the existence of the sun. And Nursi is saying that the only way for you to actually deny the sun doesn't exist, you have to be blindfolded or be blind. Why? Because the sun is everywhere it is with its reflection. The sun is everywhere with its reflection. So his point here is that it's not like a teapot doesn't have any reflection anywhere. How could you know there is a teapot or not teapot? So believing in God is not like a believing in something that you're told and you cannot really see any sign of that. And actually, believing in God is really, Nursi says that in one place he uses such phrase, he says, uh, it's not the fact that God is hidden. Russell, before that, let me tell you a story. Russell, he says that there was one interview they did with Russell. They asked him, they said, okay, you died, and you find out that God actually exists. What would you do? What would you say to God? That why are you denying God? You know, what was his response? Anyone read it? He says, I would tell God, why you hide yourself from me in the, in the, in the world? You know, it's not my fault. Like, you're playing you know, hide and seek. I couldn't find you. Nursi says completely opposite. He said God is not in hiding. God is actually intensively revealing himself. It takes your eyes to even see him because he's in He says that is um um shiddet zuhurundan gizlenmiş when he talks about the sun. That the sun, because of the intensity of its reflection, you can't really look at it. But it's everywhere to its reflection. It's nowhere in the world, but everywhere through its reflection. So in the daytime, when there's no cloud, you have to be completely mindless or absolutely blind or being blindfolded to not see the signs of God. So therefore, from Nursi's point of view or from Quran's point of view, um, this belief is a, just a deliberate choice 
part of you know people they just don't want to believe in it. it means they deliberately just blind themselves to the truth unless if they are being blinded it means that by the culture by the civilization by, by, by the schooling they could be blinded to the way that they can really see and in this and I think one of the key arguments is that modern education is really blinding people to see the science of God why the science is revealing the science of God but the education is actually the way that they do through the secular um, perspective so the Islamic perspective they are blinding people to see. yes Sure. Uh, Stephen, Stephen Gordon would say that was saying that uh, now science is experiencing more revealing God. Mm -hmm. God. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But science ba basically reveals more signs of God. Mm -hmm. But the scientific dominant materialistic or uh, or Ismi perspective in science blind you to see this to to see that. So therefore. You don't see because you're blinded to see. So that's the reason, yes. Uh, can we just quickly do a, a remedial Quran lesson for me on belief and belief in what, what is that word and what are its you mean, connotations? Uh, Iman. So that's, that's belief. And yeah, that's Iman is belief, but the way the description of Iman, it's not really, it's the declaration of Iman is Kalima Shahada. So basically, yeah. an la ilaha illallah. Yeah. It's I bear witness. It's not I believe. And so, it, so, so the bear witness basically means that it's necessary that you first see the sign. And what you bear witness, the kalimah had that's two parts. So the first part is the bear witness in terms of negation. I bear witness that there is no God. Then I bear witness that the, the, the Allah is the only God. So that is basically the description of belief or iman in, in from the Quran perspective. Tawhid, yes. So the key part here is the interesting part here is this: is essentially, it's like you enter this building, and you like the building is really you look everywhere, so the kitchens there, everything's designed, the room, you know, and you really like it, right? And you're curious, what is the source of this building? Okay, so the first thing is that, you know, you will never, what is, when you look for that one, now, um, the secular perspective will tell you this, will say, don't ever imagine anything different than the material of the building to be the source of the building. So, in other words, if you want to know the source of the building, start, look at the components of all this material, and then, then will tell you, some will tell you, oh, the window is the source, the other says, no, 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 the lamp is, looks better is to be the source. The other will say, is the gate is the source. So if you actually look at it, so all kind of alternative explanation is within the universe to be the source of the universe. So in other words, the universe is self-existing and self-sustaining. The source is here. Now, the Quran will say first, the very first thing Tawheed will say that, look around. Can any one of the part of the building be the source of building? Now, you look at the wall, you study, well, the wall doesn't have any mind, doesn't have any knowledge. This building seems as a, requires a very good knowledge, it's engineering. And if the, the wall doesn't have the mind, cannot have the knowledge either. Oh, that means you eliminate, the world cannot be the source. You look at the glasses, cannot be that. You look at the door, cannot be that. You look at everything, you look at it. This is a la ilaha part, mm -hmm. which means that you look at the existence and you find out none of the things among the existing can be the source of existence, can give you the answer of where this come from. Where this come from? Was from this, from this, from this, none. So that is absolute necessary steps in the Iman. So the Iman actually requires first negation, which means that therefore, you know, most of the time we say that atheists is halfway, halfway there toward the Iman, because to really, to have Iman, you have to be, in a way, to say the same thing as an atheist will say. You have to say, la ilaha. Then the next question is, uh, what, is, what, is who, what is the source? Or the Quran says, Allahu, Allahu, who is Allah, who is God? Allahu la ilaha illahu, illahu. What is that? 
you say, what is Allah? Man huwa? What is he? Or he says, he is la ilaha illa huwa. Which basically is saying that he is none of the things that you know as the source, but the one who is different from all of them. So in this case, it's essential part to separate the source from from um, the, the the products. So um, look, like look at these pictures out there. So you look at the picture, you say, what is the source of this picture? You can look at every part. You can never things. None of the things in the part of the picture can be the source of the picture. So La Ilaha says that never search for the source of the picture within the picture. It can't be there. Why? Because the picture has a certain quality cannot come from the part of the picture. The universe has certain quality. It's not quant, quality. The quality of, let's say, well, what is all water? It's gone. The quality, the properties of water is the quality. Where did it come from? Yes. It says it can't come from the particles inside that. The particle, where did it come from? It can come from the other particle. So in this case, the la ilaha part, the very first thing is negating that nothing has the necessary, shukran, nothing has the necessary quality to give you what you have it. Then the second part comes illallah. Illallah means that God is the one that must be something outside. The, 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 the one that who made a picture could not be in the picture. It just doesn't make sense. So until, from the Quranic perspective, until you understand that part, your understanding of God cannot be complete. Yes. So then after that you say, who is that? Oh, he says that you cannot really describe in terms of who he is. You can describe only in terms of his marks on the picture. So first you accept that the artist must be outside the picture, must be different kind of the picture, shall not be the same kind. But then you say, but who is this artist? How can I know? Oh, yes, you can study the arts of the artist and then learn about the attribute of the artist. But you, as a someone living within the picture, you can never have the understanding of the artist in terms of his own existence. You can only have understanding in terms of he does exist and he has certain attributes I can see reflected in his work. That's all. And beside that, I cannot put it in. And therefore, it says, La ilaha illa hu. Right, so I'm, I'm asking more on the, the, the act of belief. Uh -huh. So does the Quran say, like, Imanu Allah? Or, like, what, what is the, the, the Iman verb? Iman billah. Iman billah, yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, like, Amen Rasulu, Amen Bimanu Zirin. So, Amen. Okay. Amen means they believe. It says Iman, but. It so says I, Iman. Amen, yes, exactly. Okay. But, but what is the definition of Iman? That's the difference. Yeah. So the definition of Iman, Nursi define Iman in the 23rd word. He says Iman is, what is Iman? Is not the knowledge. It's not that, does God exist? Yeah, exists. Yes or no? It's not that. He says not that. What is Iman? His Iman is intisab. Intisab means that is your direct connection with God. Is your direct experience of God. Is not a form of knowledge. Means that. Like intisab. Intisab. Yes. Iman is, he defined Iman as intisab. So intisab. 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 Yes. Nesab, right? The roots. Nesab. Uh, intisab is in terms of connection. I understand in terms of connection. Which means that. Iman is not like a, a form of knowledge, yes or no. It's a form of, it's some form of uh, assurance from your side that you, you say yes. Submission. Uh, no, but submission in this sense, like uh, you get connected to submission God. Submission is, no, is it, it is con Yeah, it's connecting with God, which means that I really, I know that he is the one that created this water for me. And I start to say Bismillah and drink because I experientially 
as I know you are here in front of me, when I talk to you, I'm not talking to you hypothetically. I'm talking to you that, that as a person who exists, that I directly communicate with. I'm not making up. So I reach the level of ihsan, that's the highest level of iman, that through his actions in the universe, not only I know for sure he, is, he does exist, I actually feel his presence and existence. My iman is to actually get connected to him. Then when I say, Bismillah, I actually feel, I say out of, as I, when I talk to you, like Nursi, when he make a tafsir of Fatiha, he says, in Fatiha, you start and say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Umiddin, all is ghayib. You talk as if like he's somewhere there. Then he says, Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. He says, you say, I worship you and I seek assistance from you. So it's not iyaka na'abu, iyaka, yeah. it's not not iyahu na'abudu, not iyahu nasta'in, because normally it should be iyahu, but no, it says iyaka. So why is iyaka it's not iyahu? It's because that you might be in a ghafla, that heedlessness, you might not feel the presence of God, but you're supposed to, in your prayer, to overcome this heedlessness and to feel the khushu, that you are in the presence of God, and your prayer is direct connection and communication with God. So, believing God is not the form of knowledge that you have it is like a test exam check, yes or no, it's not that. It's a form of reality for you that you directly get connected with him. As, as, as yeah, exactly, as an ihsan, as an ihsan. So that, therefore, this is any, anything other than that, Nursi would put it as a taqlidi, iman taqlid. He will say, this is imitative iman, it's not the real iman. So the real iman, he put it in a category, the real iman, that this type of iman that you are absolutely certain about God, and not only that, you are in con you are in touch with God every moment because you know you know He's the one making you to walk, He's the one making you to talk, who is the one making you to drink things. When Ibrahim Ali Salam described in Quran, uh, who is who is your God? Anyone remember that ayah? Who says? Uh, what is it? Uh, was it that um, I, 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 what is that? Uh, he's the one that when I'm hungry he feeds me, when I'm thirsty he gives me water. Uh, was that you uh, 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 Yeah, yeah. Can, you, can you get it from the beginning? Allahu ladi wa yut'imuni wa yasqeen. Wa yut'imuni wa yasqeen. Wa yut'imuni wa yasqeen means that when I'm hungry he's the feeding me, when I'm thirsty he's giving me water. And when I, when I get sick, he is the one giving me shifa, and he is the one that, uh, you know, uh, give me life, is gonna resurrect me, right? This is so. so in other words, he described Allah as not like, he's, you know, he's saying, look, I believe in the one who actually feed me, which means like, I'm like a baby, I don't have any power, what are you talking about? I'm talking about creator who feed me every day. I'm talking about creator who give me water and make me to digest the water every day. I'm talking about the guy that he started, I think it says Khalaqani, right? He starts first with, uh, no, I think it's the Baya starts with, he's the one who created me. And then he went and talks about those things. Then he said, I, when I get sick, he's the one who gave me Shifa, gave me the healing. So this is very active God. Is actually, if you read Nursi, he will take it this very to the very level. He will say, God, not only He is in charge of everything, biologically sustaining, maintaining your life, you know, from moment to moment, He is in charge of all events in your life as well. Everything that happened to you, there is no coincidence. Everything, every moment is direct act of God, happen with His will. Therefore, you have to say, Inshallah, if you're going to talk about anything that you expect to happen. And the Prophet one time did not say he got the warning, remember, but the ayah is revealed. Because the reason that you're supposed to say, Inshallah, because everything is direct act of God. 
So, so therefore, is it, so in this regard, it's really, it's not like, um, you know, uh, I came to the point, uh, because I think to see the signs in the li life of individuals is much difficult, but I came to the point that everyone really get in life what they deserve, because otherwise God will be unjust. So if you somehow, you're not happy with your life, then that means you did not do the right thing in asking what you want from God. Because the Quran is very clear, it says, وَأَعْتَاكُمْ مِنْ كُلُّ مَا سَعَلْتُمُ We'll give everything that you really ask for. So, by asking, Nursi will say, there are different ways of asking that. Everything is just asking, because everything is from God, you can only ask. Ask means you just make intention to, with your irade, to, to incline toward what you wanted. So what is really in your heart? What do you really want in life? Whatever is that, then Allah will give it to you. Either same or even better, will never give you less than what you really deserve. Because he's all just. So in this case, Nursi, when he reflects on his life, he said when he was in Russia, in you know, a prison of war, he said he made dua that you know, he will dedicate his life and live in isolation and serve you know, and read the you know, Quran and live like a, a have a spiritual uh, advancement. But then he ended up finding himself in jail and, you know, exiles for 28 years. After that, when he reflected, oh, he realized he wrote it in Mektubat when someone asked, he said, his answer is very interesting. He turned out to explain that this is the best thing could ever happen to me, to be in jail and exile. He says, those people did to me, they actually did um, commit the zulm, injustice, but the divine justice manifested in my life in the best possible way. And therefore, I have endless thanks to God for all these things happened to me. In a way that it was like thank, thanking God for putting him in a jail in exile. Okay, why? Because that just seems like that was the best way for me to do what I really wanted to do. But I didn't know. I thought that for me, if I go and live in a cave in isolation, then I will be the best way for me to really serve the Quran. But actually, the best way for me to write something like what, what he did, he said it seems like it was, could be only possible if I you know, had gone through such experience. Which basically means you, know, you have to always look at what is in your heart. Because Allah, the Quran is very clear that you know, God is the one that knows everything even in heart. And not just what you do in act. So, but Nursi will say the du'a in terms of three forms. It could be what du'a by heart, du'a by tongue, and du'a by act. So you have to have all those things if you want something. It's not like, I really want something, but I didn't get No, if you do the proper supplication for what you want, you either get it or you get better than what you really hope for it. Because it is all just. So therefore, you don't need to complain or you don't need to blame anyone. If anyone needs to be blamed, is you. Why? Because... Don't worry, there is a God with his infinite power and mercy and wisdom is in charge of everything. So the problem is actually not other people, not other things, it's always you. You have to look at yourself. So therefore, whenever Nursi see any failure, he will always do reflection in terms of saying, is the problem in my intention? Was I really sincere when I was asking for something like this? So he will try to go and actually solve the problem from the intention. Therefore, he put the knee at the very top because he believes what is really your pure intention, that's always going to happen to you, uh, same or in a better way. So therefore, you know, he really puts a lot of emphasis on that one. Yes? And you know, I think it's really fascinating to make a division between, as you said, like the, the Iman Taqlidi and Iman Tahkiki. Like, because he says like the reject, not rejecting is something else, but having a faith or mm. believing something totally is something else. Mm. I mean like, it's not the same. Maybe yet so many people will say like, uh, like in an ordinary way, not reject God. We don't say there is no Allah, right? But this is actually different than there is one God who is Allah. So rejecting, not rejecting is not to Equal, in, in a real correct. sense. And affirmation, negation comes first, but affirmation is different than negation. Yeah, I think it's a very yeah, important, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, very yeah. linked to do, isn't yeah. that? Like, to having shahada 
Because to be able to enter Islam, to be able to be a Muslim, called as a Muslim, you have to have the Shahada, which means you have to bear witness that is, there is no God other than Allah. But this is not something not rejecting only, but to accept that which, there is one God only. Which basically Shahada in Arabic means yani Shahada, Yushahid, Mushahid. Yani it's let's say if there's car accident, police ask you, did you see it? You say, I didn't see, but I believe it happened in that way. You're not going to be Shahid. Because it requires you to wax experience and observation. Otherwise, you can't be. Because they will say, we didn't ask your belief or your opinion. Is did you see it or not? That's the question. If you did not see it, you cannot become as a witness. So, bear witness means that you have to bear witness. So, that's why a shadow is not like, you know, an amin. It's not that. I believe. No. A shadow. I will, I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no God first, then there's, uh, you know, Allah alone. So that, therefore, is really, is very, so in a sense, again, what's our point? Our point here is that Russell is saying there is no evidence. You know, he says there is no evidence, there is no tahkit iman. See? So that's, you can see how he's saying that. So he's saying that, look, it, this evidence is like the reflection of the sun is everywhere. Unless you're blind, you can't really deny that, okay? So, but the science, they're saying different. So then the question here, why is really we, we reach to this level? What is really the thing that science can explain? And what is the sign that's the key part? So normally, when you look at the science, what do you think? Which questions that science can answer? So what question, why question, or how question, or all? Or not? Which questions? Like, what is water? Can science explain it? Yes. 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 What, uh, how is water formed? Can science explain it? Yes. How is the water exist? Or how is the water comes into existence? Yes. Can science explain it? Yes. Yes. Really? H H2O, right? Yes. Okay. Why the water has the watery properties? Oh, so so you say that science in this case cannot answer the why questions. Everyone agree? Yes, I think. Okay. But how can I say from this material perspective, like how it is formed, like two H and one O, like? But but again, but let's look at the how question. If I know how the water could be made, don't you think I should be able to make water? If I know how the water could be made, shouldn't I be made to make water? No. If I know how, if I know how to make a car, I can go and make a car. If I know how the water... Can you make a water? No. You can... <laughs> no. No. No, the making is, is this. The point here is this. Uh, when you bring two hydrogen, one oxygen, the water is created. But how is created, remember we said they use the phrase of emergent properties. So that in this case, emergent properties means the unknown part that we don't know where it comes from. That is everything about the water. So in this case, if we say, okay, assume this is the way God created water. Now, you don't know how he makes it. Can you go and make the water in any other way? Why not? Because ultimately, you study the all properties of water and everything physically exists out there. Just do not create the water or don't make use the God's way of making because we claim this is the God's way of creating. Now, go and use the same raw material in any way you like, just make a water. Could you make it? See, why not? So in other words, I'm not I'm saying I make I put the make the car and put in particular way. Whenever you put the piece together, you see the car emerge. I say no, don't use my pieces. Go the raw materials out there, go use them and you make the car. If you say I really know how to make the car, you're not supposed to use my material as well. Go and make from the scratch, which I give you the basic one, which is the electron and proton, right? I give you the electron proton, get it, all, all the elements is yours. Try to make a water. Could you create a water? Not at all. See, remember Ibrahim alayhi salam's the challenge to Nimrod? When he says that, my God, rise the sun from the east. Could you rise it from the west? 
So that was the way that the mood stayed silent. Which means, my God created water in this way, don't use his way. This water is necessary, go and create water in another way. Could you do it? If not, then be silent. See? So in this case, basically, the essential part here, that if you cannot make it, means you don't know how to make it. So which means science cannot answer the how question. Either. Why? Because this water comes into existence not only from hydrogen and oxygen with the direct involvement of God. Unless you bring God into your equation, you can never explain the water. So which means that I used to think in the same way. I used to think that science can address um, what and how question, but cannot address why question. No. Science can only address the how question in relation to the Ismi dimension, but cannot address the how question in terms of the actual existence. You have to. If I, if I have to, if I want to really understand how the water is, is made, I have to bring God into the class. I have to insert God. It's one of the best guy on this one. I think I mentioned yesterday as well. Wolfgang Smith, go and read it. He actually is a Christian guy and he really does an amazing job. Um, have you read it, Wolfgang Smith? Uh, I think you should read it. It's, uh, it's wonderful. I, I wrote it down. Huh? I wrote it down. Uh, what I mentioned first time, right? So he, he has the concept of vertical causes and horizontal causes. He says this hydrogen and oxygen is horizontal causes. But there has to be vertical cause to, for the water to exist. Okay? Okay, sorry. <laughs> so there has, to be, there has to be vertical causes for the water to exist. So in this case, his point here that you can never truly explain water without God. And, and therefore, the argument of like, you know, science is sufficient. Look here. Is science explaining, explanatory, or is science descriptive? is actually science is only descriptive. Sci remember how King Statham, what did he, what was he saying? Remember I shared with you, the first class? He said that we don't need God because we, science can explain everything now. But actually science cannot explain anything. Science cannot explain anything. But science describes and reveals some things that's not visible to us, an excellent job. But I can't really explain that. Do they try to explain? They try, but it's a completely false way of explaining. It's like they discover new painting, but then they try to say, oh, this canvas is the source of the painting, you know? Oh, it's just nonsense, yeah. Yeah, it's good, the new painting you discover, but there has to be painting, it can't be any other way. So ascribing the painting to the canvas, or to the brush, or to the paint itself is complete nonsense. You can't just explain, because the art cannot be ascribed to them. It can't be explained by them. Because the art requires intelligence, requires knowledge, requires the sight. You have to see it to draw that. It can, none of those substance has such attribute to make that. So therefore, the first part is to really understand that science can only explain a part of the subject that we explored. So it can tell us what it is, it can, dis it can uh, reveal more of the things, make it visible, but it can't really explain it, okay? So it's very descriptive. So the problem in this case, basically, th that's what, remember the question that I shared at the very beginning, first hour? That was when, that's Abdullah Yeen, as a student, they ask Nursi, they say, our oh, teacher, do not speak of God. Okay, so it's basically they're talking that the main problem is separation of creator and creation. We're talking about creation without any reference to creator at all. And we're saying that that's what really science should be. Which means we think that we can explain creation without creator. But we said, no, you cannot explain it. You can describe it, but you cannot explain it. If you want to understand that you have to bring the creation. So when I look at it, uh, so therefore, uh, really, one of my favorite book is uh, Charles Taylor's Secular Age. A Secular Age is really 800 pages, I think, like it's a big volume of books. I really enjoy reading. But what I learned in that one, the guy is really, uh, I think, is one of a great mind. He's a Canadian uh, scholar. Who is the John? Charles 
scale of right? Oh, yeah, yeah. A secular age. Yeah. He says in this book, he says this. He says he came up with three type of secularization. I add the fourth one. He says the first one is the separation of church and state. We know this, like, uh, laicism, right? This, this is, I call this a pol political secularization. The second one, he says that the decline of uh, the belief in a public arena, which means that religion become less important. Society to pay less attention to that. That's the second type. The third one, Edmund, do you remember the third one? I like it, his third one, a lot. That's, I really like all of it because it's based on his third type of secularization. Right, that's the exclusion of God from the intellectual process. Right? Yeah. Oh, the third one, he says that is actually, it is the uh, seeking fulfillment uh, through the world, even if you are religious people. This basically means that, mm -hmm. if, yes. In the world, through the world, which means that your objective, I'm going to have a villa, I'm going to have this, or, but I'm going to have it a halal way, he says, you're secularized, okay? Because your objective is supposed to be the akhirah. He says, this is true for Christianity, Judaism as well. So religion was all about the hereafter. It wasn't about this world. But he says, right now, if you go to the church, he says, he talks about Christian Judaism, but I can assure you it's the same for Islam, okay? I give you some examples. Like there are some youth groups living in Istanbul, like they're very rich by the way, they are like, you know, renting, not renting, they own some boats, you mm. know, for having a trip in Bosphorus. And all these girls are having some parties on the on the boats, and so they're sharing on Instagram. And then they're putting like kind of kind of juice, but just like uh, I'll drink, you know, alcohol drink, they're doing like this no, and then like this. You like not, it, the only difference is, is that drink doesn't have alcohol, but the rest is the exact the same as the alcohol. I heard, I heard even in Istanbul they have it now. I heard, I don't know, it's true. They have halal nightclub. <laughs> and these hijabis are doing this, by the way. No more that people are always drinking, but like. Really, I heard that. that I mean, in so this what we see that they say, oh, we have halal wine. I say, what is your problem? Isn't all these other drinks enough that you think that you're going to be only happy with, uh, you know, a halal beer or halal wine, you know? Why you want to do it? So basically, you think that having wine or beer, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know a beer is going to make you happy? So that's the problem. So Taylor says that basically this is a secularization. Secularization means secular means worldly. Secularization means that everyone become worldly. That even religion, Nursi given an excellent example, he says that people go to Umrah and Hajj for their business to be better. You go there and make dua, and then you come and say, oh, you know, I have some difficulty in my business, I go and make dua, and then I come and I will have better business. She says, look, you know, this is a praise for, for the Akira. And in one example, it's very interesting. One time, Nursi was in the top of mountain in Barla, uh, you know, shepherds passing by, and he made some yogurt and brought to Nursi. He said, Nursi, this, he says, Hoja, Hoja, this is a fresh yogurt for you, you know, and make some dua for my goats. That can I give more milk? Okay, and the next day he went, the yogurt will stay in the same place. He said, Would you, why didn't you get yogurt? You know what was his answer? He said, I don't have time to make dough for your goat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in other words, they say like, you know, you, you, you give me something for the worldly expectation, and I'm going to spend my time to ask for something worthy. Just, you know, get your yogurt. I don't want that. And I don't want to spend time for your, for your you know, to make dua for your God as well. So in a way that he had a principle, not accepting any gift anyway. But his emphasis is saying that really people, when they do the goodness to you, they are very sacralized. They want to have return in this world. Mm -hmm. That why you're supposed to do everything only. Remember we had that discussion yesterday. One like is sufficient that you should do everything only for the pleasure of God. That's enough. Nothing else. That's, you know, is a pure ikhlas. So in this regards, basically, the essential problem is the, cre is the separation of the two. And Nursi is saying this is a denial of the harfi di di dimension and reducing the reality to the ismi dimension alone. So in this regard, basically, we link this one to the iqra. So Iqra and the Surah, I remember that, um, I don't know whether you ever thought what the Prophet was doing when he would stay in a cave for that long time. Remember, he will go sometimes stay for days, actually. In Ramadan, they say he will go and stay sometime in 10 days. So what was he doing in a cave? Yeah. 
Huh? What was he doing really? There was no Quran to read. What was he doing really? See? Actually, I think he was there really thinking about the existence, have the questions. Why? Because the very first ayah revealed, in a way, was an answer to what he was really thinking about. Must have some connection with it. In a way, like he had something, he was asking, what's going on? What is the meaning of all this creation? What are, why am I here? So he was asking existential questions. And the ayah revealed, says, oh, you want to answer? Read, iqra. I remember the angel says that it's three times, it's iqra. Three times, that is, I think there is wisdom behind that as well, that three books that you're supposed to read perhaps. So, and then after that it says, iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So, what, what does, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So he says, I don't know read, how to read. That means it's not about reading in a particular language. We didn't know how to read in Arabic. But then he says, when someone say, I don't know how to read, what would you say? If you insist them to read, you have to teach them how to read. Oh, it means, Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq is the language, actually. What is the language? Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq is a manai harfi, actually. Which means, that's when we look at that, it's basically saying that read in the name of God. So, first of all, it says, read in the name of God. What does it mean? It means that read in terms of seeing the connection between the creator and the creation. Don't look at the creation in isolation from the creator. Bismi rabbik. Then you see the first thing it says rabbika alladhi. It doesn't say bismi rabbil alameen. It says bismi rabbik. Why? First read, look at yourself, see the connection of God within yourself. Rabb, why it says rabb? Because rabb in Arab, Arabic still they say, for the man they say, Rabbul Bayt. For women, they say Rabbatul Bayt. So Rabb is the one who takes care of the needs of the household. He says, read that who take care of your body, who take care of your life. So it means see the connection between yourself and the Creator first. Then you can see everything. Ikra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Oh, see the very first thing that this is God is the one who creates. Khalaq. You know, in the Quran, there are two different things, a khalik and khalak, two different words, use, uses uh, both different names of Allah. Khalik is the creator, khalak is constant creator. So, constantly creating, okay? So, in this case, it says, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalak, khalak al insana min alak. See, emphasis again, create. So, which means that the essential part. This is a creation, this is being created. Don't look at this as a something has a constant, stable existence. This is something that actually is constantly being created. So the very first things that we're supposed to look at it, that we see the creation. So one ayah in Quran is very, very interesting. It says, uh, the one who can create, can it be equal to the one who cannot create? The one who makes the building, can it be equal to the building itself? Are you dumb? Don't you know from your experience they have to be different from each other? What is the differences? One who can create, one who cannot. So therefore, the distinctive Properties or attribute of God is being created. And nothing else among the creation can have such ability to create anything else. And everything else, every moment, get everything through the creation of the Creator. So therefore it says, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq. So when you read, the very first thing you read, you have to read the insan, human. You read yourself, you read human, human experience. خلق إنسان من ألك إقرأ وربك الأكرم. Now when you read in this way, everything becomes the ikram of your Rabb. Then you realize who your Rabb is the one is very generous. إقرأ وربك الأكرم. علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. So what is the most important one? That the ikram to you or is to teach you what you don't know. So the most important gift for human being is the knowledge itself. 
علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم كلا إن الإنسان لا يتغى but then he says that verily human is taghi means they are rebellious why and ra'ahu astaghna because they see themselves to be self-sufficient means they see that they can sustain themselves without creator so that's in this in the ayah says that the, the, the basically the source of rebelliousness is to not understand your dependency on God to understand your self-sufficient so therefore they say in this education the very first thing they do is when they tell you you can do it you have the power believe in yourself you, you have unlimited you know go all this look at those self-help book the self-help book if you go to bookstores you see I would say almost one-third of all the books now in the popular bookstore is all about self-help mm -hmm. and self-help essentially telling you how you could do it without God and how you should believe in your power and how you should use your power to sustain yourself a while the Quran is all about saying you absolutely are helpless if you don't have God I remember in Turkish once they made it I was like very very surprised because they affected by this self-help one of the you know Islamic religious TV channel had it a program the program title was this was saying that Chare Sistenis Chare Sistenis is this true? What, how would you correct that? Correct one? How would you correct this statement? So, char assistance, char assistance, what is the English translation? If you are helpless, you are the help. If you are helpless, you are the help. Means believe in yourself, you can solve it. If you think you are helpless, right? Char assistance, char assistance, means you are the, you are the help, you can help yourself. So, well, how would you correct that one? I actually completely reverse. I think the complete reverse of this is true. If um, chare sistenis, chare sistenis. See, complete opposite. If you think you are the help, <laughs> yes. If you think you are the help, you are helpless. Yeah, it's complete opposite. But you can see how the secular ideology basically penetrates into every culture every religion that this is an Islamic you know well-known TV channel in Turkey I don't want to give the name so but they had it this they things were like let's let's try to really promote them and have them to really to um, believe in their ability and many people will buy in this idea so yeah you know you need to because one most place when the schools we go and tell them they say but you know doctor we have to really give tell all students they have to have self-confidence i said what self-confidence what is self I said you cannot have self-confidence there's no confidence in the self how about have a god confidence and isn't that in islam called tawakkul you know but you see when you are at, you know, when you are brainwashed through the secular education you don't really know because you think yeah you know we need to really i said there's no problem in confidence the problem is that if you have seek the confidence from the self, that's a problem. So you should seek the confidence through God because you don't have any power. So, and in this regard, you should have God confidence. That means tawakkul, not a self confidence. But they will say, oh, you should have self reliance. So why not God reliance? Yeah, what is the self that you're going to rely on? You should believe in yourself. I say, why I believe in myself? I believe in God. So, but they were like, you know, I remember in the US, we tried to, for, when we were raising our kids there, uh, the, I will say the safest TV channel we had it, it was PBS and the program for kids they don't have any you know any music anything it's really very the best secular one you can find it but I remember one thing I want them to watch they will watch is like Arthur it was like for 25 years maybe you, you went with it right <laughs> but every time the beginning and the end when the, the it start and finish you will always say Believe in yourself. They make a song, right? And believe in yourself. I was like, how am I gonna? Yeah, how am I gonna? How am I gonna really remove this ideology from the mind of my kids? Because every at the beginning of every you know um, you know uh, show, at the end of it, and they make it very nice song. It is un, it's almost impossible for you to not really get this idea injected into your mind. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. And I kind of think that's really a very, very secular. That you're not supposed to believe in yourself. You're supposed to believe in God. That you're supposed to believe that God alone. That remember when the prophet with Abu Bakr, 
um, they were in the, you know, and running away from the enemy, right? The enemy was chasing them. They were hiding that, right? And they were hearing that the, uh, those people with the horses coming. So Abu Bakr was really get scared. Remember what the Prophet says? La taqsal huwa ma'ana. Says, don't be afraid. He's with us. But how, the, how does he know? Oh, because Quran says, what the Quran says? Quran says, huwa ma'akum? You remember that ayah? Yes. Huwa ma'akum? Aina ma'akum. He is with you wherever you are. So, which means he's always with you. So, but the Prophet truly believe in that, that God is, if, if, wherever he goes, God is with him. So therefore he says, don't be afraid. You know, God is with us. So that is the, now you see, his confidence was out of his belief in God. Because God is all-knowing, he's all-powerful. He can make the other two, you know, if he wants, he could change everything. And he did it, right? So, but that is, again, that is not that he was believing in his self. He believed in God. That's confidence come in belief in God, not from the self. Questions? So why, uh, why did he uh, hide himself for three days and night in cave? Because people were chasing uh, them. So this is one question. And I just recall Hadith, one person came with a horse. And Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, first just tie him, then uh, just ask Allah Taala. So this is not good that we just ask our children or we just first we should believe in ourselves uh, that we have something from, of course, from Almighty Allah. But if we do not believe in what we are or what we are from inside, then how we can get far from Almighty Allah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think again that's why when we say that. We're not saying that you could be, you should be lazy and not doing anything. But we need to understand what does asking mean. So Nursi put an asking dua in three, four. He says that asking means you ask by heart, by word, and by acts. Asking by act, he says, is absolute necessary Sharia of Allah, which means Allah established certain order. If you want something, you have to follow His order. So. Look at it, it's, it's really amazing that how the prophet and companion believe in that. The prophet was prophet of God, right? And you never read in any places the companion would go to the prophet when the enemy would come for the war and say, you don't need to do anything, you know, you're a prophet, please make dua and just, you know, go in your room and make dua and ask Allah to destroy the enemy. You never see in any place. Instead, you see that he will even bring all those servants to say, what's your idea? What is the best way to prepare for this war? He will not only hear that, like remember Salman bin Faris was the one that's making suggestion. He will actually, you know, when he finds his idea to be better than his idea, he will say, let's go by with that. So can you imagine that, you know, here ask the, you know, uh, Saida Abi say, you know, do you ask those cleaning guys to give you advice on something? If you find their advice is better than what you do, would you listen to that? See, those prophets did actually. So it doesn't matter who is saying. The key is that you look at the idea. Don't look at who is saying that. So it's not about who is right. It's about what is right. It's not about am I right? I don't care about me. I care about what is right and what is wrong. So in this case, so you see the prophets will do the best things that that is that that he knows through his knowledge that he will take the action. And the companion will never have such expectation, oh, and we're gonna, he's a prophet with us, he's gonna make dua and the enemy is suddenly gonna disappear. We don't have to really work hard, no. They will do their best to prepare for that. Which means they are understanding that God has certain order and system in the universe that you have to work within the system. And that is your respect to God because this is the way he functions in the universe. Shariah al right? Hmm? Shariah al Yeah, Shariah al Yeah, there are two Shariah, he says. The one Shariah is the, basically you know, the revealed book. The other Sharia is the, the, the rules, the order that he has in the universe. Like the way I look at it, I say like this. The one who made this building, put the light switch there, that's how the system works. You have to use it if you want to get the light here, period. Now, but the key part here is, when you use this one, you need to use it, but you should never believe the light comes from the light switch. That's nonsense. Mm -hmm. But you still you should use it because the one who established the system here, establishing this way, wants you to use it in this way. 
You're gonna say, yeah, I, I don't, there are other sisters, why you put it there? You should have put it here, or I don't want it. I don't like it. That's disrespect to the one who set the system here. So therefore you can see the Prophet and the companion had absolutely utmost respect for Allah. That's for whatever you do, they will say, well, what is really, what is the best way to do it? Remember, he will ask sometime, they will say, Prophet will say this way, they say, oh, no, no, it's not. Remember on farming thing, like that, that was an example. So it's, you, this is the something you will search and explore, you find it. Whatever you discover in terms of how the God function or work in the universe or does creation in the universe, you have to follow that steps. So that is, that is basically um, how you submit to him through his established order in the universe. Otherwise, you just don't do anything and then that's laziness. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of people, when you say God confidence that are good, they understand in terms of laziness. So Nursi says that's absolutely wrong. It's just from Shaitan. He says Shaitan making you to use this one. That he says you have to do your best to your own knowledge, whatever you think it takes. You know, you aim to go to the top university in the world. Uh, you gotta just go and say, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna go and make dua and allow no. Uh, the way to go, you have to look at what are the assessment and what are type of question, what you need to do, how to. So you have to learn that and strictly follow that. And meanwhile, the key difference is here. You should never think that all your efforts create the result for you. You will do all of them. You say, if you get to the, your dream college, you say, Alhamdulillah, it's him grant me. Why? Because as you use the light switch, you never give the light to the light switch. Because you know this is necessary to use, but not sufficient. You always acknowledge there is the power station behind that. So between that cause and effect relationship yeah, again. Exactly, that's the cause. You see him as the cause. But you so have to... There's a correlation, but it's not the yeah, real effect. Exactly. The, 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 the established so. system is not the, the actual cause. So essentially, that's what's going to come. So this is Aristotle and causation. So I think the problem with science is that in, in Aristotle, I will say, really is the first scientist. When I really read, uh, you know, Aristotle, I say this is really, really a great scientist. The way he, you know, unbelievable how much, how much, how deep the guy was, and how he was trying to really help us to conceptualize and to come up with certain methodology to understand the, the existence, but. In an Aristotelian way, you have four causes always. You have material causes, formal causes, efficient cause, and final cause. In modern science, which cause we have it? Completely cross out. Actually, you are forbidden to even mention that there is a purpose behind anything. If you do that, you're not likely to get published. What we call the talos, they call talos, is not supposed to be there at all. Okay, so because they think whenever you have that, it might be in, you know implying that there must be God behind that. So in other words, uh, I sort of would say for the table to exist, you have to have a material for the table. You have to have the knowledge of how to put the material together. You have to have the power and consciousness of how to get this knowledge and get the material put together to put the table. But it says all those three are not sufficient. Why are you going to have a table? You have to have a reason. No one in the universe, he will say, no conscious being will ever do anything with, for absolutely no reason. Therefore, he will say, nothing can come into existence without, the, without Talos. And this is really amazing thing. But the key is that they completely eliminate this from the scientific discourse. It's not there at all. And the efficient cause, they give it to something that can never be the efficient cause at all. That's the second mistake. And basically the formal cause, in a way that becomes a part of the efficient cause because they say the DNA is the source, okay? So, and the natural law and forces work with that to give you the results. So, in a way we say, um, how we get apple tree and apple? I say, is it easy? You get the seed with the information? You get the soil, water, and the sun. They come together, which is the material cause. And the seed in information, the design is unleashed itself. And it grows. The tree grows. And the fruit come out of that. Okay? So sometimes, uh, you know, 
You see, for same for human children, kids, kids as well. You see the little kids when they get in the language. You say, "Oh, mashallah, it's really grow a lot." But I say, "Why? When you see a building is the first floor, and next time you come to the Wakaf here, you see now is a twenty floors building. You don't say, mashallah, this building grows a lot." <laughs> you don't say that, yani, because you think it will become nonsense, yani. But when it comes to human, plants, and animal, you think it's okay. Why? Because the ideology out there telling us that some things can happen by itself. This living being can grow by itself. So it means that you don't need to have God to intervene to make it really grow. Okay. So uh, against the, uh, basically the final cause is not there at all. So the problem, that's how you describe. So the problem, the disconnect between God, creator, and connect creation. But not only that, that's the first part of the problem. Second part of the problem is to ascribe the creation to this new, what I call secular trio. That to nature, material cause, and chance. So get everything from God and give it to them. And explain everything based on that one. That's what I see. So from Nursi's point of view, that is the problem. That's the problem with the scientific approach. And even though, like the existence of the things are given to these three trios, actually, mm -hmm. even the attributes and the gestures and the names of Allah are given to those those three. Exactly. Like, you know, like Mother Nature is so merciful. What that cause? The causes are, you know, like. Uh, Just are just or very like you know uh, what's the word what's the word for it like they are genius mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. like even the manifestations and the names and adjectives that are shown in the art work uh, are totally re you know reflected upon those things as well while they are clearly showing the names and attributes and adjectives of the of the creator cool. this is something very yeah, exactly very interesting I, 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 I think can reach. exactly I think because the key part here, but there are two things. That's why I think sometimes we do exercise. So how would you find this embedded ideology in the textbook? So the key part is that, because normally after this class, let's say if I give you any science textbook, any, bring any science textbooks, you should be able to identify those in that. But the problem is that most likely you're gonna look, you're gonna look at the concept of nature or mother nature, or you're gonna look at the luck or chance. But this is actually very easy to catch, but there are actually implicit one that is much stronger than the explicit one. So implicitly, the way they explain it, you will see, if you, are, you have to ask questions, you say, okay, what do you mean? You have to ask certain question, and I will try to come up with some question that you can, through which when you ask them, you will take you to those. Because they do not tell you explicitly most of the time. That's the problem. But if you really ask good question, you will end up with those gods of the secular science. That's all. There's no way to explain them any other things, okay? But you have to just ask questions. I don't know, uh, Edmund, you can tell me. When I put it, I thought that those guys, they really, you know, they, um, in a way, they were in fight with Christianity when the modern science emerged in the West, in Europe. So, and in this case, that we know the story at this, what they told us, Galileo and others, that when they come up with these things, and the church at that time, really looking in a narrow way and fighting against them. So it seems like they somehow, it's my understanding, they somehow come up with something to completely replace this, what people believe in it, and then in a way that they wouldn't do that. So um, therefore I said that basically um, they come up with this, you know, uh, secular trinity that were called, sometimes I used to, I, I don't know, some, I was advised for some to say don't use trinity because it might be insult for some and use trios. I start to actually change toward the trio more than trinity. But the reason I said trinity in a sense of saying, look, those guys, they actually come up with this concept that they were trying to replace the concept of God in their, their time, in their society. But I don't know if it's really, if it can be perceived as a, you know, a, uh, let's say uh, insult. Absolutely, that my, my, my it's, it's not my intention. It's uh, it's not it's not, or at least if it is offensive, there are so many things uh, yeah. that are so much more that I I didn't even. Yeah, no. Because the reason I'm saying that, like, because I think 
the, you know, uh, believers all around the world, they have to really unite their mind and heart to first, you know, fight against the secular ideology because this dominant secular ideology is crashing every kind of belief, okay? So it's not like only for Christian Jews or Muslims, it's for every kind of, because it's denying all of them, you know, altogether. So therefore, I think we have to, so Nursi is very, very strong on that one in terms of really having those people of faith to come together to fight against the disbelief. So he truly believed in that, and he even had the interpretation of some hadith in a way that, that Christians and you know, Muslims will be united against atheism. So he will do like, you know, when people will look at this in terms of like a conversion of one other, Nursi will not look at it in that way actually. He will come up in terms of being united together against the enemy and understanding that this is an existential issue and the threat is for, for both of us, for all of us together. So that's why I think he'll look at it in this way, it's not the other way. Um, so again, it's all the, it's the essential part is really is all materialism, materialist ideology. And one thing is materialism is long dead, but it actually is in a textbook and teaching. Materialism is everywhere, or sometimes they call it physicalism, sometimes you call it positivism, is actually is all type of materialism. Unfortunately, the materialist ideology, despite the quantum physics, is still very much everywhere, even when you say, what is consciousness? It's nothing but just interaction of matter. So which means that they reduce the entire human reality, entire existence to the matter, nothing other than like one say, you know, what is the difference between, let's say, my own, you know, kids and this piece of paper? They will say absolutely not, nothing. Why? Because they both are made of atoms, electrons, protons, all identical. Really? I mean, there's no difference between my kids and piece of paper, but I feel there's a big difference. Why? Because they reduce the entire reality to the material reality, nothing beyond that. So that's why I call it this, they replace it this. Uh, with the Christian Trinity to the secular one. So nature become mother, rather than father become mother. Causation is, becomes basically some things as a result of the, you know, uh, nature, they come from that, and then you have the, the chance, in this case, I put it this way. Uh, yeah. So, and it, it clearly says nature is enough. You don't need to really have God, you know, and mother nature, as you mentioned, you can find the natural laws um, naturalism, so it's, it's really all there. And again, how would you explain, let's say, water of water example? So, what is here? Look at here, can you apply that one, those three things? Hydrogen and oxygen come together, make water. That is the causation. So, hydrogen and oxygen is the cause of water. Uh, the reaction of hydrogen, uh, HO, and the emergence of water regularly, oh, that's a natural law. See? Nature working that way. See? And then the unique properties, oh, we're very lucky we get that one. Oh, that's chance. Do you see that? When you ask the question of what is water, it's your, their ultimate answer is through nature, material cause, and chance. So therefore, you can see is actually, ultimately, those are the three. Uh, so again, the example we use is really on the light switch and line. Now, normally, again, the light switch up there, you get the light. So uh, what is the uh, scientific approach? The science will say, look, there's a light switch, and there's a bulb, there's a wire. Study them very well, and when you get a problem, fix it, and that's all, nothing else. But then you get the utility bill, you say, no, 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 no there is no, I don't believe in uh, that. I believe what we get is here only. I'm not going to pay any bill, anything. So that is exactly what the science does. In a way that ascribing what you get it to the material cause and they prove it that, you know, when they turn off, there's no light. Turn on, there is light. That means the light comes from that. But you say the light, then basically, it's Nurse's argument, he says, study the light switch, study the wire, study the ball. Can any one of them give you the light? No. Which means la ilaha. Then, you say there must be the source of light, something beyond those costs. So essentially, the secular one is saying that, uh, you know, just focus on the light and light switch and wire and ball. That's all. Don't think about the power station. And secular science will say, just focus on the material codes and natural laws. 
there is no power behind that period. Okay, so and that's really uh, the problem in this case in the science. So in a way that we say, that's AI draw it to me. So as if like you go, you know, someone invites you or you go down, you eat the food, you say, where is the source of this food? They show you the oven, they say, oh, the oven make this food, really? The oven can make it food for you? Yeah, I can give you the, you know, recipe as well. But it will be a complete insult to the chef that working down and preparing food for you. So in a way that basically the way the science is explaining everything, they, they tell us, look, you know, when you enjoy the food, never think about the chef. It's only then the Just process the, the, of making it. Because it's the arena that science is explaining. Yeah, the science expla explains the recipe mm -hmm. and describe the process of creation. Of Describe that. it, not explain it. So in other words, assume the chef in the kitchen is invisible, mm -hmm. someone watching and taking notes and write the recipe, which means describe the process, okay? And then tell what are the ingredients used on that. That's all. But there's, then you get the recipe, you get the ingredient, you go and put in your kitchen and wait and wait and wait, nothing happened. Or in the moment the question is, is asked, like, uh, how this, uh, you know, food uh, uh, prepared, how it's prepared, mm -hmm. and then you are giving an answer, like, you know, uh, there's tomato and there is banana okay. and there is this and oil, this and that, and then it is made in that way. But it is a process of uh, the, uh, the, making it. Exactly. It doesn't explain. The process of explaining water. how the chef act and put them together. Mm -hmm. Without the chef explaining the food, it's exactly like this, saying, oh, no, we have a delicious meal and the oven prepares such meal for us. Therefore, I asked the AI, I said, draw it for me, and this is the AI draw that. It's that amazing, it's really, that's what you believe, that you believe the oven make a food for you, or you believe a chef make for, for you. So that is, again, the thing. So in a, the other analogy I use, it's like remote control and TV. So it's like believing that the remote control is the one that making what you see on a TV. Why? Because you, whenever you press on the, let's say, green button, you see that, you press on the red button, it disappears. And it works always in that way. But then now you think this is the cause of what you see there. See? There is a connection between what you see on the screen and what is on the remote control, but you get it this as a causation. But when you, you're supposed to use your mind and study what you see there and study the property of the remote control, and say the remote control cannot be the source. So, and um, that is all for that part. Any questions? I think it's, uh, oh, it's four times, yeah, as so we exceed our time. Uh, so, uh, I think that's all. So, are we going to have it tomorrow still? Yeah, we're done. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I thought that. Yeah, so tomorrow we'll focus on, on, on that part. So, it's basically, um, then we're going to talk, and this is all about problem, right? So the question is, how are you going to bring God into the equation? How are you going to re-establish the connection between creator and creation? So tomorrow, we're going to talk about how to really you look at the creation through the Harfi perspective and establish this connection. So we'll focus on that one. And if we have a time, we'll talk about the model we develop within that, that the 5D thinking is based on the Harfi perspective. We'll give you a brief, like, at this overview of how we come up with certain a model with, through which that you can actually have such integration uh, of the knowledge. Okay? Yeah. If you suggest any uh, chapter of, uh, from the side of the book, oh, I, before we come into the uh, I think, I don't, yeah, I Various think. Places, yeah, there are, there are, because there's most. Yeah, as you said, 12th yeah. world, we yeah. are already. Uh, I told you, we, no, this is not about 12th world. Um, you know, it's the worldview one, it's, NA is helping a lot, actually, a lot of, from the NA, but also, you know, yes, yeah, Tawheed, but again, it's Mulk, Malikud, Ibda, Insha, you know, this is, you see that how try to connect that to career, right, yeah. creation and creator, um, see, that's the AI also drawing, we're going to talk about that, so honeybees, uh, how should you see that, the trees, you know, how should you see that, um, you know, the causation, we're going to talk about that, again, uh, Tabia, Risale, see, that's, that's from there. So it's actually from various places, not from one place. And we're going to get back to the area. So it's very... And in the Holocaust, we are reading, we just 
Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think from uh, this part, one of the essential part is the Risale, uh, the 20, 23rd uh, ladder. No, 23rd, um, yeah. not word, not word, uh, Lama, uh, Flash. uh, uh, flashes. 23rd Nature. Flash. Oh, yes, yes. This is one of the essential ones. So that's one, and uh, 30 words on the anem is one of the very essential, but is really the key. But we're not going to cover anem. But what we're covering mostly about the tabia, okay? Because tabia, the, the risale on nature does cover a lot of those concepts, but it's really various places, various places, not one place. So just separately published the fitra kiras in Okay. Okay. No, the, the idea that you mentioned about the Qur'an, uh -huh. uh, just r I realized uh, first while we were you know, talking about it, you know, he said, Allah said, you know, this is Rabbika Allazi Khalaq. So, and then uh, he gives the example of insan rather than the universe. Mm -hmm. So, like reading our stuff is much more yeah. important than reading the universe. Yeah. Because we talk about that and you actually mentioned the three books, books yeah. right? Yeah. But also, it does put the human yeah. as the one important yeah. part of triangle. Yeah, but that's why Quran, I said the universe, and the human. Exactly. So yeah. the Quran, the universe, and human. Human is a micro universe, microcosmos. So and uh, so, uh, so, the Quran and the universe are actually both the same books. It's kind of like an umbrella that because yeah. it's really fascinating. But the, and you see the Quran is the first command is read. Yes. Exactly. And uh, it's just like an umbrella of all the other verses, yeah. you know, starting with read. With this book, with the other book, and with the third book as well. Amazing.